Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode six of The Pornographers. Uh, we've got an amazing episode today. Uh, today's we're featuring uh, the subject of alpine pornography um, and this ice and snow. And basically, we've got some amazing alpine pornographers that um, really take it to the next level and, and you know, hike out to some really remote locations with extreme weather, extreme, extreme conditions. Um, to, to make some amazing uh, panoramic images. And um, so we're going to kind of, you know, go through their, some of their approaches and techniques and, uh, and hear a little bit about the history of, of alpine um, photography and alpine uh, panography and the evolution of, of where it, you know, started from and where it's, where it's at right now. And we're also going to look at some of the equipment um, that our uh, alpine pornographers use in the field. Um, and in that, I'm going to introduce you to the guests. Um, the first guest we have today is Thomas Warps. He's broadcasting out of Munich, Germany. Hey, Thomas. Hello. And the second guest we've got is Matthias uh, Togwalder out of Zurich. Perfect. Hello. And the third guest we have is Joe Poulton. And he's broadcasting out of Vancouver, Washington in the United States. How's it going? And uh, you might remember our fourth <laughs> guest from two episodes ago, Eric Hansen from x Red Studios. And he's broadcasting out of uh, Santa Monica, California, and uh, is probably has the best lo weather location on from, from our guest in the show. And then last but not least, we've got Gerald Blondie, and he is broadcasting out of, uh, if I pronounce it right, uh, Keronov. Um, out of the Czech Republic. Hi, everyone. Great. Yeah, did I pronounce that right? Or uh... <laughs> it, It's a painful one, but it's Kirnov. Kir Kirnov. Okay. Kirnov, yeah. Kirnov. Yeah, I, I always butcher these, these names. I, I apologize. Um, so in that regard, I think we're just going to turn the show over to Thomas and have him get started on his, um, his presentation. Yes. Uh, thanks, Gavin. Yes, uh, I want to first uh, introduce a little bit myself. Uh, I was born in Munich, Germany and was almost living all the time here in uh, Munich, except my years before school. Um, I have been grown up in a little mountain hut in the Allgäu Alps. I will show it you here. It is called Sportheim Böck. And this uh, mountain lodge was built by my grandpa. And my mother and my uncle were working there. And I was there all the time until I was six years. So I have a very close relationship to the mountains. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That looks like a nice place to grow up. <laughs> yes. It was a nice place, yes. But sometimes they had not much, much time for me. OK. So a little bit about my my uh, background. Uh, I'm not a, a professional photographer. I'm an amateur. My real profession is a little bit different. Um, I studied electrical engineering at the Technical University of Munich. And later, I worked uh, 10 years in a software company doing medical and analytical equipment software. And then after that, uh, I changed to a consulting company, management consulting company that is called Basicon, and I'm still working there as a partner. Uh, perhaps uh, some information about private life. I'm married, have a very sportive wife, and that's good for my activities. <laughs> and <laughs> oh boy, do I know about that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And two sons, they are seven and nine years old, and. Uh, Yes, they have to suffer a little bit about my hobby, about the mountaineering and about the panoramic photography. But I think uh, at the end of the day, they like it because I go with them uh, to stunning mountain places. And as they are sportive, it's no problem for them. Um, I started with uh, panoramic photography very, very early. Um, it was in '99. And my first panoramas, I will show you one. 
these first panoramas, they were not captured with a digital camera. This one, perhaps Matthias, you know this place. It's a very touristic place. It's the Kleine Scheidegg with Jungfrau Mönch and Eiger. And I made this shot on a diapositive film uh, that I scanned later. And uh, the quality was not too bad. I'd zoom in. This was quite OK. I have a lot of uh, film material like this, but I, I think this is the only one I published. And I was very happy when the first uh, digital cameras came out. I had an Olympus E10. This was in 2001. And with this Olympus, I made my uh, first digital camera panoramic shots, like this one from the beautiful Allgäu Alps, not far away from the place I grew up. Nice. And those were a uh, little bit noisy, but it's still possible to look at them today without saying, Wah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they were not real full cubes because I did everything freehand. Then the Canon 10D came out and I bought it and I made a trip to the US and perhaps the US colleagues know this place. Oh yeah. Yeah. And this was the first one real full sphere. This is uh, a summit of Half Dome in the Yosemite National Park. I made a three week holiday with my wife there. This was really a great stay there and really great landscape. And I took a lot of photographs there, uh, but I only published two. I have so many materials, unpublished materials, because I have much work with the website. Um, yes, and uh, then I had all versions of the Canon 5D, Mark I, Mark II, Mark III, and this is the equipment um, I'm working with today, and this is the style of panoramics I do today. This is also from Allgäu Alps. This is Breitenberg near Pfronten. And my work is now really full sphere panoramics in a, let's say, 100 megapixel uh, resolution. I will show you later a little bit about the equipment I use. It's a beautiful shot. Yes, another one with a little bit higher resolution, which is about 300, 300 megapixel. This is from the Bavarian Alps. This is the place I go most. I also shot a lot of panoramics last year when I made a trip with my family to Iceland. Perhaps some of you know this place very well from the uh, Panoramic Photographers Conference. We made a lot of hikes there and drove into the middle of the country. Unfortunately, the weather was not so good. I only had a few days with a little bit sunny skies. The rest of the days were rainy, but I took all the chances to make uh, these panoramics. So, now I will show you what equipment I use. Just let me change to screen share. There you go, we can see you again. Mm, no, it does not work. Yeah. Just a second. Now it's full screen. So, what is special with uh, mountain panoramic photography? Uh, first of all, you have to carry all the equipment. And I, as a mountain panographer, uh, try to make all summits by fair means. That means no helicopters, no cable cars. Second... I know Joe's um, smiling right now. <laughs> <laughs> 
Second, uh, sometimes I'm very exhausted when I reach the summit. <laughs> um, third, it could be very, very cold. If you look at those panoramic shots, you cannot imagine how cold it is there. And in many, many times, uh, there is a lot of wind. This has some impact on the, on the requirements uh, of the panoramic equipment I need. It must, of course, be lightweight. And it's very important that the setup is very quick. Uh, when you go mountaineering, you don't have much time to build up the equipment at the summit because you have no uh, time there, because you have to hike down very quickly. And also, if you have cold fingers, uh, the equipment should be easy to handle, also with gloves, of course. And the equipment uh, just has to work. It must be robust and, and stable. And I can show you what equipment I'm using. I have to switch back. So can you see me again? Yes. And I have brought my rucksack I'm normally using when I go mountaineering. Can you see it, the orange rucksack? Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, let's say, slightly used, but in excellent condition, the British would say. And I will unpack it a bit. I think this is the most important part of the equipment. This is my tripod. And I found a very good one. This is a Gizzo tripod. It's lightweight. It's about a little bit more than one kilogram. And it has a very great feature. It has a leveler. You can move the middle pillar here to level the camera. Before, I had an extra leveler, and this was extra weight. And I also had another Gizzo tripod, with which, which was 700 grams only. But uh, this was really a mess, because um, it was uh, blown away by the wind one time, and I could uh, just rescue my camera by gripping one leg of the tripod. <laughs> So, what is also part, I carry two lenses with me, one for the higher resolution panoramics, this is a, a Canon 24mm TSE, this is really a razor sharp lens, with this lens I can do panoramics up to 300 megapixel, the other lens. I use is a very, very old one, but I like this so much. It's a, the old Canon 15 millimeter fish eye. And with this lens, I only need uh, 11 shots for a full sphere. So this is quite a lot of weight. Now the heavy things are out. This jacket in the rucksack, and then I have a new thing from Bushman Panoramic, <laughs> 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 because this little thing, the Kalahari, is a very, very lightweight uh, panoramic head, and uh, before I had another Ninja 3 with a RD16 rotator, and this was quite a heavy thing. So I changed and made the first panoramics with this great head. It's really good. Good to hear. So what, what else do I need? This is very important, these gloves, because I always have cold fingers, and they freeze when I take the photographs. What brand of, uh, what brand of glove is that? This is... Mammut. Oh, okay. Yeah, Mammut. Swiss product, I think. Yeah. This is also very important because I, I this is a uh, uh, some kind of how do you say headlamp? Yes. Because uh, I make a lot of panoramics in the dawn, and I hike up when it's dark, so I need this thing, and the last thing I need to take the photographs is this. Uh, radio remote control, it's a Hell Giga T Pro. This is really the only one 
that works well when it's very, very cold. I tried several ones, but this is a really good one. Yeah, I was going to ask you, do you, uh, do you have special batteries that you use? Um, do like, for instance, your Canon 5D Mark II, II and III batteries last when it's down, when it drops below zero? No, no, this was never a problem. When okay. they are fully charged, this I also could uh, use it with a with a live screen mode uh, for one hour or more. But uh, if you are not finished within, let's say, a quarter of an hour with the panoramic, it is spoiled when you make it in the dawn because the lighting situation is changing, so this was never a problem. I only have one spare battery, and that's really enough for a, for a big shooting session on the mountains. You know, you raise an interesting point, too. I, I, I guess we can ask Eric when he gets to his presentation. Uh, you know, the robotic, I always wonder how the batteries on those robotic rigs will, will last, and uh, I know a lot of people that do the extreme uh, panoramas, you know, like, a, let's say, the gigapixel a gigapixel panorama in a very cold environment. Um, I haven't been able to re always rely on the robotic rig, so they've had to take like the, you know, a manual head such as the, the Noble Ninja, um, or is it the M1 or M2? So, I have a robotic head too. Uh, let's say a more uh, or less handcrafted head uh, by no, it's called uh, Giga Panbot but I never used it in the mountains because it's simply too heavy. Yeah. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and I, I want to have control about the panoramic shooting, so I do everything manually. The only problem is if you use a, a high triput, uh, that it's a little bit difficult uh, to rotate the camera in the right way manually, and this takes much time. So. I would really like to have a lightweight robotic head, but I did not find uh, one on the market so far that is suitable for my purposes. So all those panel head manufacturers out there, if you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, so far. Let me find the right window. So a few words uh, to my workflow. Just turn on the screen. So I'm, I'm using uh, to assemble the panoramas a very, very simple standard workflow. I make uh, three to five bracketed shots. Uh, the pre-processing I do in Lightroom uh, to get 16-bit TIFF images. <coughs> and then I use uh, the Oloneo uh, photo engine to make the HDR assembly and the tone mapping. So I do the tone mapping uh, before stitching. Uh, I use the resulting 16-bit uh, TIFF files and stitch with PT GUI, and the result is uh, the assembled panorama in at a 16-bit PSB or, or TIFF file, depending on the size. And then I use Photoshop and uh, Pano 2 VR for retouche. Pano 2 VR I use because it has a very, very good f a transformation tool to make the Zenit and the Nadia retouche. Mm -hmm. And th then I have a 16-bit TIFF. And then I have an own Excel tool, and f together with Photoshop, I make the uh, geographical adjustment because uh, on the website, on my website, on which I publish, all panoramics are uh, geographically right adjusted. Uh, so you can really use a compass to find the right direction. And I have a developed a tool. Uh, to get the right adjustments, this is an uh, Excel tool uh, with some macros. So when it's adjusted, I have a 16-bit TIFF, and then I use the Kaya Parna tools to make the tiling, and then I put it on my website, the mountainpanoramas.com website. Um, some words about mountainpanoramas.com. Uh, it's my website. Uh, and it is live for four years now. 
And um, the reason why I made an own website is because I, at the time I started it, I found no, no platform that was really suitable for high resolution panoramics. And uh, there was a new release of the uh, Car Air Pano player uh, with multi level and high resolution, and none of the platforms existing at that time was using it. So I decided to open up my own website totally dedicated to mountain panoramics. And uh, also the possibility of this Car Air Pano player to write custom uh, plugins uh, gave me the last push uh, to do this project. And now uh, Mountain Panoramas is live for four years, has this multi-level high resolution feature. Uh, it is not a self-service website where you can publish yourself because um, I want to keep the quality on this website and if you make it freely accessible by everyone, I think uh, this will not work. Um, I have since uh, a few weeks a new mountain region map where you can find all the panoramics. I can show you the map later. And the really special thing about this website is that all the panoramas are labeled uh, with mountain names. And uh, all these labels are linked. Uh, when you find a green label, there is another panoramic there, another mountain panorama. And when you click on that uh, green label, you can surf to the next uh, summit. I have an example uh, with me. Some statistics about mountain panoramas. It's live since four years. We have now 45 photographers publishing there. 10 are very active. We have 760 panoramas online and 120,000 labels now. Uh, that uh, mark the summits on the panoramas and 16,000 links, quite a lot. I can show you an example. Yeah, I think, like uh, I think I'm very curious to see what the, I know you, and you're, you can show some of the um, amazing uh, pan panographers that are adding content to that site as well. Yes, uh, let me try to switch to my web browser. No. Now, if I get if I if I understand correctly too, you're taking the the, the panoramas and you're uh, geographically placing them in the right location. Yes. But then you're also marking all the mountain peaks. Is that correct? That is correct. Can you see the panorama? Yes. Yes. If you go down in the right bottom of the picture, there is a button, labels on, and now you can see that all the mountains there, this is a uh, mountain in the Bernina range, photographed by an Italian guy called Valentino Bedugnetti. You can see that all the mountains are labeled. Here, the whole palace of the Alps, and a lot of labels. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I think that'd be more than a day hike there. Yeah. And you see also, I think this is a gigapixel too. You, you can zoom very close. And this is a very well-known station, the Diavoletza. And here we have a green label. And when I click on that green label, now we go to Diavoletza. It's loading. And now we are there at Diavoletza. And we are looking back on the peaks where we have been coming from. And now with these uh, 760 panoramics, it's already possible to virtually hike the whole Alps from the eastern part near Vienna uh, to the Monviso in the southwestern part. Wow. Uh, so can I ask you, Thomas, what have uh, what are some of the benefits that people have seen from from using this website? The benefits. 
Uh, I ask myself what is the benefit of this website. Yeah, there are of course some benefit. It's, it's just for fun, but uh, there is also another benefit. We have now enough panoramics that you can really inspect a mountain before you hike it. You can make your tour planning, can look around, and with all these labels, you can learn about the geography of this region. It's beautiful. And so, what would happen if if a, a pornographers came and they shot a new version of, of from a similar location? Is there a way to, you know, add one that's right next to a, a previous image, um, or do? Do sort of like the newer images take precedence over the older ones? Excuse me. How how to how to get an image onto mountain panoramas? Yeah, I mean, what like let's say you've got an image, the one you're showing right now. Yes. Let's say I I fly out there and I shoot an image very similar, but maybe it's yes. higher resolution. Does there yes. an option where you can choose between the images that are taken from similar locations? No, we we have a uh, let's say a privileged version. Uh, on the map, here we have the map. Um, we have a privileged version, and we make uh, links in between those panoramics. Uh, at the moment, we have no mechanism that uh, you can, for example, choose between high res, low res, dawn, sunset, sunrise, winter, summer panorama. Gotcha. We just have one. The best one is the privileged one, which will be shown on the map. Gotcha. But of course, the others are also shown on the website. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and um, I see here you've got its other locations other than the Swiss Alps. Yes, we, we all, uh, the most of the panoramics are from the Alps, from Europe. Here we can zoom in. We have a three-level map. And here you see all the Alpine regions. And then you can click in and uh, zoom to the panoramics with, with all the pins. You can see in some regions there is still a good, uh, is already a good coverage. But uh, we also have other panoramics from the world. We have some from the Arctic region, mainly Iceland. We have a few from the US. We have a few from South America. And we have a few from Africa. But uh, yes, at the moment, we have no photographers from the US and only a few from the Nordic countries. And I would very much appreciate if we get a little bit more from those regions. Um, one um, comment to the labels. You uh, might ask yourself, how do we do all these labels, uh, these 160,000 labels? Do we put them in all by hand, identifying each summit? No, we don't, uh, because I have a partnership with uh, another website which is uh, managed by and created by Ulrich Deutschle. Uh, hope I can change. Back to the presentation. Can you see the presentation? Um, see. There it is. Yes. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just well, I just saw it a second ago, but we we just lost it again. <laughs> yeah, this is another very great website. Uh, Actually, Thomas, we can't see it. You can't see it. I uh, cannot. No, I I can, Gavin. Oh, okay. you can. Okay. Yeah, oh, there it is. Too. Okay, great. He's speaking. Yeah. This is a very great website. Uh, it's made by a friend of me, by Ulrich Deutschle, and he has a, a complete geo model of the Alps and other uh, mountain regions, and he has a big, big database of all the summit names. And um, with this website, you can render a virtual panorama with all the summit names labeled. And what we did is we created a web interface that uh, Mountain Panoramas has an auto-label function now. 
This means uh, that uh, the labels are calculated by the engine of Ulrich Deutschle and then automatically inserted into the panorama. So we do not have to do everything uh, manually. Of course, wow. there is some manual work uh, because it's, there are much too much labels. You have to select them and, and correct a little bit because of the photographic distortions that uh, they are not always correct because uh, the horizon is not perfect and, and other distortions uh, might occur. But uh, this makes the process of labeling, it shortens is it uh, dramatically. So we can really uh, label each of the panoramas with uh, uh, very accurately, some have uh, up to 500 uh, labels. <coughs> what mount Did ranges what? does he cover? Excuse me? Um, it, w on the website, um, do you know which mountain ranges are covered? By Ulrich Deutschle? Yes. Uh, I think it is the Alps, a uh, part of the Himalayas, uh, US not, a uh, part of the Nordic countries, Norway, uh, Sweden, Finland, and uh, the Carpats, I, I think, are also covered. Wow, that's fantastic. Uh, you will find a link. You will find a link uh, on the homepage of my website. Oh, that's great. So, I think this is a unique function of this website, which makes it a bit special. Um, so, what what is the process of being a, a contributor to your website? Do they have to go through it? Does a, um, a mountaineering photographer oh. or Alpine panora um, panographer have to go through an application process? Yeah, somehow, yes. Uh, we have no formal application process. Uh, I get uh, some pre... Uh, just if you want to publish a panorama at Mountain Panoramas, just send me a preview, then I will uh, get into the contact with, with the photographer and uh, look on the panorama. Um, the problem we have is that um, the quality control of the panorama is very uh, strict and we have to review each panorama so the publishing capacity is very limited. At the moment we are publishing one panorama uh, a day so uh, we have to select a bit. I get mm -hmm. many applications but uh, I also ha help uh, mountain photographers to get a good quality in their work and I support them to make good panoramas uh, that are, wor are worth to be published on mountain panoramas. But uh, uh, there is no official uh, application process. So if you are interested, please do not hesitate to send uh, me a preview and I, I will then get in contact with you. And I'm assuming um, mountainpanoramas.com, that's the best way to contact you. Yes, uh, okay. there is an impress, and there you will find my my email address. So, but mountainpanoramas.com is not me alone. We have some really great alpinists and photographers there. Uh, ten of them are very very active. I want to name Dirk Becker and Roland Hoffmann, who helped me to set it up that to get a little volume on it. They were really the photographers of the first hour. Dirk is a really mar a real marathon man, doing so many summits. Uh, Roland is working also together with me. He's a colleague in the consulting company. Now uh, he made a course and he's a uh, mountain guide at the Deutsche Alpenverein. Then we have Stefano Caldera. He is really a master of the lonely places in the world and he makes exceptional fine art photography. Then we have a guy from Saxony, that's Sebastian Becher, he makes really perfect runs uh, from stunning places, Emanuel Rapp from Algoi, then we have Valentino Bedognetti, also from Italy, he's doing so many summits, he has an incredible performance and also perfect perfection, he has a Nikon D800 and uh, I only get megapixel, uh, gigapixel panoramas at the moment from him. 
Then Arno is publishing on mountain panoramas, Anton Treuretzbacher, Bruno Schlenker, and Thomas Bredenfeld, perhaps you know. Thomas Bredenfeld, the author of the panorama book. And uh, then we have also a few panoramics from uh, other people that are well known in the panoramic uh, scene, for example, from Hans Stöhle or, or Jan Köhn, and last but not least, uh, Matthias Taugwalder also contributed three of his uh, great panoramics. Yeah. Yay, so. Matthias! Good <laughs> <laughs> <Still> here! <laughs> okay, so that's all from me. At the end, a little advertisement, what we do at the end of every year, we make a selection of the best panoramics of the year that are suitable for print, and we make a calendar, a big format calendar, uh, 30 by 60 centimeters, and uh, the publisher is a well-known Bruckmann Verlag. Perhaps if you have no present for somebody so far, the year uh, 2014 has not begun, maybe uh, this would be a good idea. So I switch back. Great, Thomas, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. And uh, mountainpanoramas.com um, just seems like a really phenomenal website. OK, so we're going to uh, turn it over to Eric Hansen now from x Studio. And uh, he's going to kind of go over um, one of the, his Alpine projects that he worked on, uh, I think it's about two years back now. Eric, yeah, that about correct? that. By the way, my video camera is not cooperating, so I can shake my cursor at you right here. That's, that's about all I can do is roll over my enemy. Yes. <laughs> I actually am here, but uh, it's not a bot. But in any case, um, well, great. Well, thanks a lot, Gavin. Uh, you heard plenty from me two weeks ago, so I'm not going to spend that long on this. But uh, what I Gavin asked me to talk about the project that we've done with David Brashears and Glacier Works. So. And this was a project that uh, I think got Joe Poulton going, uh, the other speaker you're going to hear moments from now. And uh, so it was, this was a pretty, pretty interesting project. Um, this is represented on our site. If you go to the work section here, um, you can go down under Glacier Works. And this hap started a few years ago. Actually, let me bring a slide over here. And you can see this OK, Gavin, I guess? Yep, yep. Uh, green That's sharing. great. Okay, um, but in any case, we uh, I guess I became aware of the gigapixel images that David was shooting of the Himalaya a number of years ago, and I met him at a conference at a film festival, and I said, uh, David, great work on what you're doing in the Himalaya. What? How did you get started doing this? And he said, well, I went to this website called X-Rex, and I got <laughs> kind of inspired by that. And I said, oh, well, that's great. It's actually X-Res, and that's me, but that's that's great, you know, so we started talking. <laughs> But uh, I should probably take out X-Rex as a URL. It's like, <laughs> miss that all the time. But in any case, uh, yeah, David uh, originally, I think, was kind of tutored by Christian Block uh, here in L.A., who wrote the great HDR book, of course. But uh, and Christian kind of helped him do some of the stitching and advised him a little bit on the shooting. Um, we kind of took, uh, kind of got involved with him more on the 3D side and kind of continued to advise him about uh, the use of the Rodeon. This is an image here of, of uh, David, uh, I think he's in, actually, no, I'm sorry, he's in Tibet right there. Um, but in this case, he's using the, he uh, established using the Rodeon, which we use as kind of our, one of our primary gigapixel uh, robotic devices. So we, we've done a lot of custom programming with the Rodeon, so we shared that with him and, you know, different uh, tips and so forth. Um, now, David, of course, is the one I'm going to show you mostly David's work. I'll show you a little bit of what I did uh, in the Himalaya about a year ago or a year and a half ago, but um, most of the imagery that I'll show you today is shot from David and his team up on fairly high locations. Um, and one thing that David has done, this slide kind of talks about it, is that he's tried to uh, continue the, uh, what should I say, the, I don't know, the pantheon of, of alpine uh, photography in the Himalaya, started by George Mallory and Vittorio Sella. So he's uh, established different relationships with uh, their uh, uh, heirs and uh, is able to use some of their images to match. So he's done a lot of re-photography from the same locations with Gigapixel. 
And the story goes, I think, that he was originally inspired just to do this reef photography, but as he began to do it, he noticed a severe retreat of the glaciers. He was rather stunned by what he discovered by doing this reef photography, and as a result, he got inspired to create this nonprofit called Glacier Works, which is trying to put the world's attention on climate change issues as it involves uh, uh, the retreat of the glaciers. Um, he's done this in a variety of areas around the world, but primarily concentrated in the Himalaya, where um, his point on that is a very good one, in that as the glaciers retreat in the Himalaya, there's the largest uh, uh, concentration of humanity that's dependent on those glaciers for water. So the, the uh, uh, Indus and the, Hindu and the uh, Ganges and so forth uh, feed from the Himalayan glaciers. So I think he's got, he knows all the statistics, but it's you know billions of, of human uh, beings that are reliant on these glaciers. So that's the importance that he attributes uh, to this. We, so anyway, as we got to, to uh, know him and begin to work with him, we were you know uh, more than enthusiastic to join his efforts on this. Um, and he's done a number of different uh, presentations, uh, installations, and, and so forth, and continues to do so. And now he's working a lot with Microsoft, and I'll end by showing you a few things, very recent things that he's done with them. Um, but in any case, the one thing that we did right off the bat was we tried to, to convince him of the, we, we trained him in Gigapixel, but we said, you know, the other thing you could do here for documentation is you could use photogrammetry and you could begin to, we could develop 3D modeling of the different areas for you. Um, so what we ended up doing, let me show you an image here. We developed a rig for a helicopter. Um, he flies a lot with an Italian pilot, and I'm going to forget his name now. He's a famous uh, Italian climber, hangs out at uh, Everest quite a bit. Um, in any case, uh, this was a rig that we technically designed for him. I think he, he used about seven... See, I'm, trying, I'm looking at this, I think it's seven 5Ds, where he's uh, screwing in a support right there, that's for one that's going down. So I think it's six across, yeah, six across and one down, so seven. And these were configured with a Zeiss 21, I think is what we spec for it. Uh, we used some really right stuff bases, we had some custom machining done for this, etc. So uh, the idea here is that he would uh, fly these uh, drainages and basically shoot uh, a pano every, oh, I don't know, probably four or five seconds. I think he did it manually. I'm pretty sure. I don't think he used an intervalometer. But in any case, he came back with a stunning, stunning amount of panoramas, just unbelievable. Uh, some of the most incredible things I've ever seen. And the shot these in December when the atmospheric clarity was very good. Um, so he has just some tremendous things. Now, obviously, you're going to be able to see this in a moment when I show you what he's done with Microsoft. But in any case, this is where it all started was this rig, um, which we, we helped him design. Um, from that, um, this is some of the shots from it as a presentation showing how they overlap. Basically, it's not a full sphere. It was, I think, uh, Greg could tell you, my business partner, I think it was about 270 or maybe less, 220 across and... 160 or something vertical, um, but nonetheless, uh, and obviously the, the one of the issues we had with this is we were kind of clipping a lot of the, the peaks as he went into the uh, uh, the different drainages, but in any case, from that we get a massive point cloud and we get ultimately a mesh out of this. Now the processing required for this was tremendous, so what we ended up doing, let me see uh, Gavin if I can, actually can you play that YouTube? Oh sure, yep. So this is a, we worked with a company called URC that had the computing power to actually assemble all this from the panoramas. And I've loaded this up on a YouTube. You could, uh, it's public, you can all. You can go ahead and talk. Uh, Eric, can you still talk? I'll be back on. Okay, I'm back on again. I think maybe you muted yep. me. Sure. Yep. It okay. should be playing now. Uh, I don't see it, but do you? Do I need to open up my window for that? Uh, do you guys see that now? I don't yeah. see it. Um, nope. Whose window or is, is it going to be shown in, Gavin? Mine or yours? It should be appearing in mine. I'm not sure why. Maybe your screen sharing yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, let's see here. Do you guys see that? Mm, just you. Nope. Mm. 
Well, if not, I can play it on my side. I have it loaded yeah, up. Yeah, why don't you yeah. give it a try on your side? Okay, no problem. Um, and can I full screen this? I guess I could try, huh? Yep, that's working. Okay. So this is about a two-minute demo. It's probably going to look kind of low resolution. There is a higher resolution version of this. I'll let this one play, though, maybe for performance. But uh, this is a small presentation that URC put together to show what they did. And um, so what you'll see here are, let's see how this opens. There's a, again, an image of the rig. And then, uh, let's see, what is he? Okay, here's the overlaps. And these are, this is from one camera. Remember, there's seven, so it's a, it's a wonderful. So he basically is getting a partial sphere. Now, here's the reconstruction. This is all in point cloud. And this is multi-billions of points. It's just a phenomenal piece of data, um, just extraordinary. Um, and, of course, point cloud, it's almost dense enough where it looks like it's rendered. Again, this looks very low resolution. If you go to this uh, URL, uh, Gavin, maybe you can post it. I'll give you another URL that's higher resolution. You can really see the fine detail in this. Um, and then what they're going to cut to here is a render where the point cloud is converted into a mesh. That's what this is. Yeah, I think this is the mesh now. So this is a better uh, rendition or rendering of it. And at this point, this is an arbitrary camera move, but kind of simulating about what he flew. Um, he's flown up to, I think, 28,000 um, on these flights. And you'll see that in some of the uh, Microsoft work. But you can see it's a beautiful recreation. So anyway, the bottom line is this is a wonderful documentation effort uh, that's come from a, pan a series of panoramas that, uh, that created this, this piece of work. Okay, let's see. All right, so um, let's see. Now, I guess I'll just go ahead and show you the, um, the Photosynth result of this. So if you go to photosynth.net under preview, this is a new, you, you may have seen this. I think this was posted on the panel list a few weeks ago. Um, so this is now taking one of the partial panoramas from this flight and then uh, simply moving through it. So this is new image blending and kind of reconstruction tech that Photosynth has, uh, has had that uh, they've kind of polished out now and made pretty nice. So it's a nice hybrid between a video and an interactive piano. I don't think these are, yeah, these are not spherical, but uh, they do have the resolution. So you can see Pumari here. We can go in and actually see this at full resolution or back out and continue. Let's see if I can, oh, my other, no. there we go. And uh, so this is one of his, his, his high flights. Uh, into the south call over here. And again, pretty extraordinary. So um, so this is not 3D uh, representation. It's simple uh, image manipulation. It's using uh, some 3D to reproject some of these images. Anyway, this is all now a public preview, and you can uh, work with your own imagery in this. Uh, it's pretty stunning. So That's it's, amazing. It's great to see. And he's got a couple of these. One, he's got a, uh, a survey of base camp uh, right here where he flies much lower in different regions. So pretty stunning. Wow. Um, and as far as work that, that we've done with him earlier, the one thing that attracted me to his panorama is this is one of uh, his earlier uh, pieces, is that there is tremendous resolution. I think he was using... You know, it took us a while to, to convince him of the merits of, high, of telephoto lenses. He was using, I think, 100, maybe a 135. I think it was, this may have been 100, and it's still beautiful, um, without a doubt. Um, but the, the great thing is the Himalayas have so much detail, um, you know, comparatively in other alpine environments. But the thing that really struck me about this is over here on the side was this is the layering of the ancient uh, seafloor beds from the uh, deposition of all the seafloors over the eons and then upthrust and sheared. So to see this detail was just extraordinary, and I've never seen this in any other alpine images of the Himalayas, so I was really quite stunned uh, by these. Now, anyway, these he's got different ones. He has some from the Karakaram here, which are just equally stunning. There's K2. Um, broad Peak, um, 
and I forget the name of this one, but just unbelievable uh, renditions. So really, really stunning work that he's he's creating. The other thing we did for him was we, from some of this data, um, which was uh, acquired from this, what we ended up doing was doing some camera work for him. And this is a, I'm not, I'm not sure how this is going to play on Vimeo here. Is that pretty uh, choppy? No, it look, looks pretty good. Okay. So this is uh, rendered in 3D animation software where we're taking the data, we're taking the gigapixel image, but we're registering it with the data and then doing a thing called camera projection where we're uh, projecting it on. We're kind of like a slide projector projecting it over the data, and then we can take a second camera and kind of fly it around the scene. So this is a great way to get cinema, cinematic type of shots um, that are controllable from this bit of work. So that was another uh, interesting thing that we were doing for him. Let me look at my notes here. Um, Eric, you were, how, how long were you out there with, the, with his team? Well, what so these were these were shots that he's taken in his his uh, different trips. Um, I think about and I was telling Greg it was funny about a few years ago. I said, you know, Greg. I said David's going to invite us over any day now, and and literally the next day he called. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there's something about that you should you know be careful what you ask for. But um, so we ended up going over there, and I can show you this here. This is on our site. And uh, so this is in 2012, and last year. So what he wanted us to do, I'm a climber from the past, but I'm not a practicing uh, alpinist. Um, I did a lot of training up in the Northwest, where you'll hear Joe Fulton speak of. Um, and I'm actually originally a hang glider pilot of, of summer for I used to fly competition and so forth and that. But um, these days I'm a little more grounded and shooting more. Uh, but in any case, so I wasn't coming along this trip to uh, to uh, climb with David, but more to document the trek to Everest Base Camp. So he wanted us to capture. Basically, David takes helicopters in uh, frequently uh, due to his connections and so forth into base camp, and you can't do it directly. You do have to step through because of acclimatization is a big issue, of course, in the Himalaya. If you do the trek, obviously you're going to go slow enough where it's not an issue. But um, he said, why don't you guys come up and document, uh, I'll just kind of tab through some of these. This is as you land at Lukla um, Airport. This is a very common kind of trekking uh, route and just shots taken along the way. Now, as we went uh, through here, there's Ahmed Ablam, and uh, he did want us to go shoot the uh, Kumjung school that Hillary started. So we, uh, we made connections there and were able to go into the classrooms and shoot panoramas and so forth. Same thing with Tengboche Monastery. We uh, were actually able to record a ceremony and uh, so forth. So we shot, uh, we had a video shooter with us. Um, I did all the gigapixel and still work. And we, you know, just had a, a trip of a lifetime. It was a very, very terrific thing to do. And I'd recommend it to any of you. It's just a really, really great uh, experience. This is an, actually an interesting image from uh, Everest View Hotel taken in infrared. And if I go in deeply here, I know you said not to go too fast, Gavin, but let's see. So here's the peak of Everest. But again, shot in infrared. Ama de Blom looks really beautiful um, in IR. And wow. uh, so we had a lot of, a lot of fun uh, kind of capturing that here's one of the many villages along the way. Anyway, so some of these are represented um, here. This is a standard spherical shoot. This is uh, some of the beautiful Tibetan artwork. And this is in a, a portal that you go through. This is very fascinating, especially from an outsider's perspective, to try to understand what's going on here. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's rather amazing artwork, uh, going from a you know, placid bodhisattva to this you know, rather horrific scene here. But uh, but anyway, uh, really, really terrific things. And we did some photogrammetry from this also. This is the interior of Tengboche uh, Monastery, which they're not afraid of color. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's kind of like traveling in Mexico, a lot of uh, vibrant uh, paint. But uh, in any case, this is these were some of the shots that David was interested in capturing. And this is the... Uh, uh, the Kumbu Glacier. So Everest Base Camp, this is Ling Tren here. Everest Base Camp is back. Actually, I think you can see it. Yeah, there it is from here. 
So there's the base camp. This is all on the Kumbu Glacier. Now the glacier has this covering of earth and stone, so you don't, you know, you see the occasional upthrust of ice. But literally, this is a giant region. I'm standing on a ridge looking down. And the startling thing about this is that this is the original line. So what I'm going to do with this image is, uh, is integrate some 3D modeling into this of the original level, which is pretty much even with where I'm standing and going out. And you'll be able to, in KR Pano, we can go between before and after uh, and see the tremendous recession. Uh, of this glacier. So it's very kind of sad actually to look at a lot of this and realize just what the last hundred years have done. Um, this is an image of the ice fall uh, looking in and we can find, let's see, yeah, there's some parties there. This is not, not that high resolution. Um, but in any case, um, and then of course this is just a beautiful shot from Ama de Blom, which is the kind of the uh, the the best uh, the end location for a trek out there and it gets you up high enough where you can actually see Everest um, which is you don't actually observe it that much on the trek uh, down below but anyway this was a, a great trip with him and we put together um, lots and lots of images what I'll do is I'll close here on uh, let me call up a well actually I'll just show you here um, some time lapse work that we've done here too. And I'm going to skip through some of this. I'm only going to play a little bit. But this is a camera projection taken of that one shot that you saw. And then I'm going to skip forward to the uh, Himalayan section here. Sorry, let's see. There we go. Now, is this uh, choppy? It must be. Gavin, is that true? Uh, a little bit, but not too bad. Not too bad? Okay. Yep. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that we post um, links to all this content in the, in the show notes. Yeah, that's right. This is all online. This is some of the 5D video that we were shooting. And I should give credit here to Eric Poppleton, who was our uh, my uh, compatriot on this on this trip, and he again handled all the 5D video. We assembled quite a rig for this and uh, lugged this up. Looks like you had fairly good weather while you were there. Well, spring is the, you know, that's the climbing season there. Let me turn this down. Uh, and spring is kind of a mixed bag. So you get a big buildup at the end of the day, and then it clears uh, clear at night. So, there it's, so the mornings are clear, the afternoons build up. See, this is a standard night shot, um, clear as can be. This is Puma Ri across from Everest. Wow. But uh, so yeah, you get kind of a mixed bag, and because of that, you get some great time lapse. I'm gonna kill this now. You get some good uh, opportunities, uh, you know, for weather and so forth there. But the the best time to go is clearly in the uh, in the winter when it's uh, very clear. And actually, the monsoon uh, monsoon season in the summer is the worst time. Um, but the winter, if you can handle the cold, is actually you know. Uh, devoid of any kind of storms. But uh, anyway, that's that's pretty much all I wanted to cover here. Let me see. I think I covered uh, most everything there. So, uh, yeah, the only other thing I could say probably of uh, import to the community here is there is an issue of weight. Uh, you know, uh, because in the Himalaya you have Sherpa support, uh, porter support. Um, you can kind of take the gear that you want. We brought a 500 uh, Prime, Canon Prime up there, which was 
again, I had people shuffle that for us, so that, that <laughs> kind of makes it, you know, a little less honest maybe, but, uh, but you can get the gear up there. And, of course, if you're climbing and you have climbing quarters, um, you could do the same, I suppose. So David, you know, um, you know, is able to get the Rodeon up there without, uh, without a doubt. I'm anxious to, to hear about this Bushman rig because that anything that's engineered for very, very lightweight obviously is going to be of great interest to the climbing community. We've advised uh, Jake Norton, also another well-known American climber, and you know, again, you can't you can't convince an alpine climber to carry much at all. So, uh, you know, I think the advent of a very very lightweight uh, panhead with uh, maybe say the Sony A7 or one of these uh, newer lighter cameras is going to be a great uh, kind of uh, you know uh, movement ahead for the alpine world. Awesome. Okay. Well, amazing work, Eric, as always, and, um, you know, I'm sure, unfortunately, we're, we were not able to get the Q&A uh, module turned on for this episode, um, but... So people can email us anytime. Yeah, but people know from uh, from the two shows ago how to contact you guys, but we'll make sure we include all that in the show notes, and um, amazing work, as always. Um, we are going to turn it over to Joe Paulton now. Um, who actually, it's a, it's a nice segue into his, in his work. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> um, I guess I'll just uh, jump from what Eric was talking about with some uh, screen shares here. Um, oops, that moved. And so, is, do you see that? Uh, yep, I do. Yeah, yeah okay. So basically, my life as a climber and photographer, I've uh, been climbing since I was 15, skiing since I was four, pretty much grew up in on Mount Hood, and then got into photography about probably 2006, and 2007 got my first camera, can at least my first digital camera, um, Canon 30D, and took my first panoramic, which is that second one, which is this one, and that was in about 2008, and at the time I was just starting to talk with Eric about how to do things and all that, and sent him this image cropped, and that ended up becoming a trip down to Yosemite for the x Yosemite project down there and that was an amazing experience where I pretty much got to meet Eric, Greg and about, what was it, like 70 other people including Gavin and there was lots of equipment, lots of gear, lots of knowledge all in one place and then fast forward a couple years and I was living in Colorado at the time, and that's when I wrote this article up, and at the end of it, I researched about Glacier Works and kind of, I think I mentioned them down at the end of this. Um, here's some shots from x that they did for the Yosemite project. Um, but basically the stuff x did and Glacierworks did in the Himalayas was kind of the initial initial kickstart for yeah um, for the Columbia Icefield Gigapixel project. And so that kind of started oh what a couple a couple years ago 20 in 10, late 2010 was when I really started trying to get this project off the ground and um, eventually finally got got some sponsors, got a little funding and did some test shots on Mount Hood and one of them is this night shot of Mount Hood. Can you guys see that full screen? Yep. Okay, so this is the f uh, 
a Zeiss uh, 51.2 night shot. Uh, took the Giga Pan up there, which is the robotic panel head that I mainly use to test it in the cold environment. And then you can see uh, the lights of Portland just irradiating the west. And I'll zoom in a little bit here and kind of show the resolution. But it was definitely cold up there. So it was a good kind of cold weather test for the robotic head and my camera. And I actually had to... Um, let me come out of this and go back to go back to this, and I actually had to. Um, do you have me back on the screen here? Yeah. Yep. I can see you. Okay. So since I don't have ice spikes like Gavin does for his tripod, I actually had to anchor. <laughs> uh, I anchored my. Uh, tripod to the ice with my ice axe because that slope of that of uh, Mount Hood right there was um, moderate but it was really icy so I couldn't really get the tripod to stay on its own legs without skating away on me and with the gigapan going which is this big beast um, it's definitely heavy but I like it because unlike uh, some of my colleagues here, I'm a little bit lazy when it comes to the shooting. I like to get to a location and let the machine do the work for me while I sit down and have like hot chocolate or a meal or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and then this is my main camera, the Canon 40D right now. And thanks to Eric at X-Res, I was able to use a 400 millimeter for the Columbia Icefield project. And let me go back to the screen share here and get into this window. Okay, so basically the idea of my of the Columbia Icefield Gigapixel project is to acquire the high resolution images of the Columbia Icefield and also kind of make it a bit more local for the communities that reside in the Columbia Basin. And so here we got basically Portland, Vancouver area and the Columbia River going along here. And I'm going to just zoom out kind of slow here. And the Columbia River kind of goes up and along this dark line. I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, and then up over here, this is basically the Columbia Lake. This is the headwaters of the Columbia River. And then it kind of snakes north for a little bit and then drops back south for the river. And then the Columbia Ice Field is right up here. And it's obviously one of the many ice fields that feed the Columbia River. And the other thing that makes the ice field unique is that it's a uh, it's what one of three hydrological apexes. The other one is um, in Siberia and then there's another apex on Triple Divide Peak and so this basically feeds I think we lost your audio, Joe. Hey, can that uh, can everyone hear Joe's audio? Nope, nothing. Hey, uh, Joe, we lost your audio. I think you might have accidentally muted yourself. <laughs> Yeah, we can't. We can see you, but we can't hear you. Uh, are you back? No, no audio. Okay, we'll have to come back. Yeah.
Yeah. Okay, well, we're gonna come back to we're gonna come back to Joe's presentation um, when he gets his audio working. Um, um, we're gonna move over to uh, to Gerald. Are you still yes. there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm uh, Joe Blondy from Bushman Panoramic, and uh, I think uh, everyone will be interested in the lightweight equipment. So let me try and share my screen. I will present to you first the equipment. Is it working? Uh, not Basically, uh, uh, are you screen sharing? Page. Yes. Uh, I don't. Does anyone see a screen share? I don't no. see it. No. Nope. I'll try it again then. Is it working? Uh, let's see. No, I do not see. No. I see myself in the. I see the screen. Let me try and quit it and start again. Okay. <laughs> having sorry, everyone. We're having a little some technical difficulties. Um, we can probably move over to um, Matthias. Yes, we can. I think we're going to move over to your presentation, um, <clears throat> and then we'll hopefully um, Gerald and Joe can get their um, connections working again. Okay, perfect. So, um, welcome everybody. Um, first of all, thanks, Kevin, for for this format. I think it's it's a really cool way to to share ideas, and that's. Probably the most important thing uh, that you should remember of my presentation. I think yeah. it's important to discuss with other people, to share experiences. That's the only way you can improve your skills and and um, kind of share this this uh, spirit we all have. Um, let me just share the screen. Um, I prepared some some slides um, for those who. Don't know me. Um, I am. My name is Matthias Tauberger. Um, I grew up in Zermatt, Switzerland. Kind of specialized in high alpine, high resolution panoramic photography in the past years. I'm also specialized in interactive content for um, tablet apps, where I work together with media outlets and agencies, and did several exhibition projects. Um, during the past years, um, for example, for the Swiss National Museum, always on the topic of the topic of alpine panoramic photography. Um, my company is kind of an image agency specialized on 360-degree panoramic content. Um, I work with uh, certain magazines where I organize panoramic content, that, but that's just as a side note. Um, so, for for this presentation first, um, I guess you always know the Matterhorn mountain, not the one from, <laughs> from Disneyland, but yeah. this one here. <laughs> one. So um, that was the view that I had when I was on my way to school every day during my childhood. So I literally grew up right um, at the bottom of the Matterhorn in, in Switzerland. Like the, I guess you know the Toblerone chocolate boxes, which have the same, um, um, triangle uh, shape. So, um, um, so just to be sure, um, Switzerland is located in the center of Europe, as you might know. Um, Switzerland looks like that. That you have here the, the in the further further uh, bottom there you have. Surmount with peaks like the Matterhorn and the Lüferspitze, and the Alps go there or from France, Switzerland, towards to to Austria. So that's that's the region um, where I'm I'm doing my tours. And um, so for the the upcoming presentation, I do um, two parts. One is 
about the, the history of panoramic photography, um, because I think it's also very important to, to see or to, to see and to know the, the history of this because um, let me just uh, I'll just switch screen sharing off. Let me just check. How do you guys switch it off? Yeah, I can see you. Uh, no, you can see me. Okay, because I think it's it's really important to to know um, what was there before us, um, and especially for alpine panoramas, there's a huge history um, of photographers pioneering uh, in taking panoramic photographs um, in the Alps and, and other regions. So um, so it's really uh, I think interesting to to know. A few facts. Um, so you have to see. Um, photography was born in the, the mid of the 19th century, um, around 1850. The first cameras came out. The first technologies to to shoot uh, pictures to to fix an image on 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 glass plates at that time. And so um, it. It was a, a kind of a, a time like like a pioneer pioneering time. We we have sometimes uh, now with with interactive uh, with interactive uh, panoramic photography. So um, let me just put on screen sharing on again. So it is the same time um, that you have in the Alps the first ascents of the mountain. Around that mid of the 19th century, and it's it's a time where where the first climbers come to Switzerland to the Alps. Um, for example, the British Alpine Club was founded in um, 1857. Mountaineering is kind of um, a sport for gen uh, for gentlemen, and the British um, made the Swiss Alps kind of like the hotspot. So to be. So, um, one of the interesting stories during that time is the first ascent of the Matterhorn, because the Matterhorn was mountain was one of the last ones, last of the famous ones in the Swiss Alps that haven't been climbed um, at that time. So, um, at the 1860s, um, there were two climbers that try to reached the summit. One is, is Edward Wimper, an Englishman, and the other one, the Italian, Jean Antoine Carrel. So it, it was more like, like a climb. It was a race between Italy and England. And then finally, 1865, Wimper reached the summit. But um, as you might know, um, during the descent, there's this tragic accident where one climber slips out and um, Four, four of the team members die, the rope breaks in the middle, and so on and so on. And Queen Victoria even um, thought of forbidding climbing to all Englishmen. Um, one reason I'm telling you that as well is because it has even has some, some uh, effect on the chat tonight. Because these two guides that survived the accident were my great great and great 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 grandfather. So if they would have died, I wouldn't be here tonight. So kind of I always felt interested in in panoramas then during that. And interest interestingly if we take the term panorama, if you ask someone what is a panorama? He will say, well, nice view, nice, nice mountain range, and so on and so on. But in fact, the term panorama goes back to, to these um, cylindrical paintings you have, where you have a cylindrical print, and you can you can look around, you can can experience a certain spot. And these panoramas were a bit earlier than, than when, when photography came up. It was, it was one of the first uh, mass media at that time. 
So the word panorama from the beginning on is about experience and it has no connection at all to mountains, which is rather interesting. And then after the mid um, the, the, the middle of the 19th century, the first photographers come to the Alps, shoot panoramas there, new ways of taking pictures are developed like uh, pictures in, in wide format, where you have this kind of panoramic view. Um, that's the time then when the word panorama gets connected as well to nice mountain landscape and nice view and so on, so on, so on. So these first photographers um, have or had a, a big influence on the fact that uh, the word panorama now means also nice mountain landscape. Um, I will just um, mention a few of the, the pioneers of, or of the masters of the, of the panoramic photography. Um, at that time, one is um, Vittorio Sella. We already heard, um, heard um, his name before. So, for example, um, I hope you can see this picture. I guess so. So, for example, yeah, we, yeah, we can see it. For example, if I ask you, can you tell me which year that image was taken? What would you guess? If I tell you that it was the Karakoram Mountains K2, I'd say 1920. It was taken 1907. Wow! By Vittorio Sella, he was. He was um, at that time already a very experienced mountain climber and well known um, all over the world. And he was together with the first Italian expedition that then reached later on K2 in the Karakoram mountain range. So the, the special thing about him is that he shot with, um, with photographic plates, so glass plates. So he really had heavy, heavy equipment. So that's, that's something you have to, to, to keep in mind. At, at the beginning um, of panoramic photography, the equipment was, was very, very heavy and, and so on. Um, it was very difficult to, uh, to shoot such images. And then, we, for example, we can go on um, some of his images that's, I think, also in the Karakor mountain range. Again, that's, that are big glass plates, so they are razor sharp. Or here, that's in the Alec Glacier in the Swiss Alps. Now, if we, we are speaking of the glaciers retracting, today there's no glacier around yeah. at that level. You still see it uh, far, far away, but, but they retract quite a bit. Or, or glass caves like this one here. Um, he also did, for example, if you take this one, that's a panorama he shot. So you see um, the, the single shots, the glass plate of the glass plate. Uh, and that panorama was shot in 1882 on the summit of the Madron. That means only 17 years later than the first ascent, at a time when, when it was still very difficult to, to get to these locations. And it's even more remarkable um, when you think of the fact that they carry it about, I think it was in between 40 to 50 kilograms of equipment up there like 15 glass plates, they um, developed the, the exposures right there on the summit, so it's absolutely outstanding, the work uh, Sela did. Um, he was really one of the first pioneers. Later on, um, he, when he died, there was, uh, what's the English word, obituary, when someone dies, 
Yes. Yes. And there was an obituary um, uh, about him, um, about his work, and so on, in in the in the journal uh, of photography, written by Ansel Adams. So, <laughs> you, so you see, he was Ansel Adams was one of his biggest fans. So uh, that should give you an idea about uh, the, the the quality of his work. Um, so. Let me just go back, um, because the reason um, of these images um, is that one um, um, exhibition project I did was focused ex exactly on that historic aspect of panoramic photography from the first um, pictures on um, that it, it was for the Swiss National Museum. For example, here, that one here is the first picture of the Matterhorn Mountain taken in 1852 or something like that. The original, not a, not a copy, and so on. We, we had there the whole um, evolution of panoramic photograph in the Swiss Alps. And after, you, you see this uh, tendency then, um, after the, the first glass plates, um, after that, those problems were solved, um, the cameras become lighter. Um, you have tourism starting um, to use panoramic images for brochures or for uh, uh, cards that you could fold and send um, throughout the world and so on, so on. It, it goes on like, like that. Then uh, Kodak brings up the, the, um, the Kodak panoramic camera, which was the first, uh, first camera with bendable film. So the cameras um, became uh, smaller, lighter. You have more and more um, photographers. Um, uh, and with, with them, um, they reach uh, new heights. They uh, kind of do this kind of, uh, of a documentary of their alpine ascents with, with those cameras. Um, and then, um, during the, the path, the past century, at the middle of the past century, um, then um, the, you see a tendency where um, the photographers try to improve the technology. They um, try to, uh, to uh, reach new heights, um, photographically speaking, um, which means um, they're trying uh, out new techniques um, that they can shoot with panoramas. Um, one of those famous one was Emil Schultes. It was a Swiss um, Swiss photographer. He worked as an art director for a Swiss art magazine too, and he shot the the, the famous um, panoramic image top of Switzerland. I'll just show it to you later. Um, but I guess you might know him for this image here. That's one of his most um, most uh, famous images, which is um, a 24-hour exposure of the midnight sun, shot around uh, 1960 or so, 61. Wow. That was really uh, the international breakthrough for him. And, and then, Later on, um, he shot for um, for Swiss Air, the the former Swiss uh, airline. He shot an image called Top of Switzerland, which is this one here. And they um, it was shot in 1979, uh, 1979, I think, 1970 around that time, um, with three wide lux cameras, I think. And so the image is, in fact, just a huge poster that you can take out, which shows the summit of Dufferspitze, which is the highest part of the Swiss Alps. And he even did some, some fancy things, like he had a problem with the sun. So he just um, had a device there. Uh, to show to a helicopter pilot where he has to be, so the helicopter. <laughs> That's brilliant. 
So um, that's, that's much better um, way of blocking the sun than just yes. using your hand, right? Exactly. And so, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just an inter interesting uh, fact. So um, this image was, was very well known and also used at the World Exhibition. And as I know, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, sold several million times internationally, this top of Switzerland shot. And during one exhibition that I made, we also had the very camera there that he used, which is this one here. And surprise, surprise, um, he got in contact with a Swiss company who just started at that time, or not no, they were already in business, but a Swiss company specialized on, on panoramic equipment, which was called SITES. <laughs> so it, it was the father of the, the of today's uh, sites guys. Yeah. And they at that time then developed developed um, this panoramic camera. And you can even see here with the with the the, the uh, slide thing there and the trigger and you have it below the helicopter and so on and so on and so on. So he shot Many many um, aerial images in in Switzerland also did publish many other books. Um, another one is is Willy Burkhardt. He um, was born in 1922. Uh, um, he then kind of um, um, kind of uh, perfectionized the the way to shoot aerial panoramas. And uh, the interesting thing here is that he's still top fit, and I had the chance to do um, two exhibition projects together with him, and we became friends. And so it's it's really interesting to to get to know um, this uh, former way of shooting panoramas, if I call it like that. And uh, Willy Burkhardt is shooting also with large format films. Film. Those are just a few snapshots that I did back then as preparation for the exhibitions we did. And so you s you have to see here that you have a negative of maybe, um, or the positive of maybe 12, 11 to 12 centimeters by 40 centimeters. Wow. So you have a huge resolution there, and it is probably the the best thing um, that you can come up um, to gigapixel photography before before the, the term gigapixel ex existed. You can still do really high resolution scans of that. And then he, he had these outstanding shots here. Well, you also don't have to worry about stitching errors, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> That's that's not. You see, also see here he shoots more than 360 degrees, around 450. And so those are just just a few to show you, kind of the way he works. So absolutely outstanding. So. Um, I can just let me show you um, the a few shots of the of that other exhibition I did together with Billy Burkhardt. Um, again, here we had the historic evolution of panoramic photography in Switzerland with fancy cameras like this one here, where you turn the plate around. Whoa! That's amazing. Um, and then here you have you have all your historic photos. There are plenty of other photographers as well. These these three are just 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 uh, three of them uh, to name. And here you see uh, the top of Switzerland panorama on the bottom from, um, of Emil Schulte's area above as well. And then um, that's one of my shots. I come to that later. And here you have the area of of the work of Willy Burkhardt. So, as you see, um, I, I had the, the chance during these past projects um, 
to get to know get to know um, quite a bit about the history of panoramic photography. And the, it's, it's really interesting also if you if you uh, see the original shots, you see you see the, the neg negatives, you see the positives, and it's it, it, it tastes, it still smells, not tastes, smells. <laughs> um, so it's really really an interesting part. Um, said that, I think for uh, as introduction for my personal work, um, which is part two now. Um, I think it's really important to see to see the big picture in in, in, in the images we do. Um, it's we're not um, just uh, taking a snapshot or or um, photographing something. With panoramas, you can capture a specific moment at a specific time, and especially with VR panoramas. So it's it's about experience. Like if you go back to the the first origin of the panoramas, if we take off these, uh, if you think of these uh, cylindrical images, so that's that's really um, the beginning, I think. And this is also what we should aim for as a result when people look at look at um, our work, especially with Alpine panorama, panoramas. If someone who has vertigo looks at a panorama and gets dizzy and then you know that you did it well. So um, let me just show you a few of the examples before we start. Um, what do you have them? Here. So let's let's um, take this for example, which is the the summit of the Matterhorn Mountain, the one you saw just at the beginning. It's one of the not so interesting um, peaks in Switzerland because there's one peak missing, which is the Matterhorn. But you will see it if you take a look at the shadow. You know on, on which peak you're standing. So um, that's one thing. Um, and Worth mentioning here is the, the position. I will come to that later on. I'll just show this as a teaser to you. And so you see, um, it's 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 really about for me. It's it's about um, capturing that moment, that last moment when you reach the summit. Also, like like Thomas said before, um, I also do my uh, mountain trips without any usage of helicopters and so on because I, I strongly believe that you have to earn the summit picture kind of and and also by by doing that I think you have kind of a of a of another perspective um, you have the perspective of a climber reaching the top said that I um, also have to say that I'm first hand First hand, I'm a, a photographer, and then a climber, so, which means that um, I have to prepare really uh, uh, seriously for for these trips. Uh, we're not just we're not talking about um, uh, easy hiking trips here. Here we're really talking about the high Alps, and there you have all kinds of dangers. Like weather changes, sudden weather changes, you can get uh, altitude sick. Uh, your physical condition can be a problem. Um, you could have a problem with rock slides in summer, winter avalanches and crevasses. So that's why, um, for me, um, for me, really safety comes first. Um, that's why I'm doing my high alpine tours uh, with uh, mountain guides, which are locals. They they do these trips on a regular basis. They know each stone, so to say, on the way up. And because you really have to plan for the worst case. But what happens if 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 the weather changes? If you have an accident and so on, so on. So that's really important here. Safety comes first, especially. Especially with these um, with these uh, 
big trips. Uh, I will be showing a few examples afterwards. So um, then you need to do a lot of preparation and planning in advance, which means also phys physical condition and training. You have to be fit. Um, you have to know the spots where to shoot in advance, by, which means that you have to uh, you have to uh, spot locations in advance with with uh, Google Google Earth, for example. You have to pre-visualize the panorama before that, and there it's not always the highest um, summits that are, are the most interesting ones, but but the the, the smaller ones that are just a few hundred meters below the, the highest mountain, so that while standing on the on the mountain summit, you can still look up and look around. And so you also be need need to be aware that you have a nice composition and so on and so on. Um, during the climb, you have limited time. I mean, it would be nice to stay on the summit for, for hours, but you can't. With the high, high alpine tours, you're, you're maybe limited to, to 20 to 30 minutes to be on the summit. And sometimes you have to react to weather conditions. Um, if it's too cold, um, for the photographers that you get frostbites, then that was it. Then you just turn around, because safety comes first. And, and also, as for the equipment, you really need to get routine um, with that. And and the lighter, the better. It's of course, it's always kind of a, a uh, trade-off in between quality and weight. So for me, I'm trying to shoot at the highest possible um, quality that I can, but still with some reasonable weight. Um, at the time. I'm shooting with an Icon D800E, and uh, as panoramic head, I'm using the the sides VM drive. Since I'm also doing uh, lots of um, gigapixels, and especially for the gigapixels, um, time is critical for for me. If you're, for example, if you were standing on a high summit, um, you're shooting a gigapixel with 300 images. You have moving clouds. Then you need to be fast. So, uh, with the with the sides rear drive shooting in continuous mode, you can shoot such a gigapixel, which is maybe around three to four gigapixels. I think you can shoot that in in six six minutes or eight minutes. Um, yeah. I'll show another example later. So, um, for me, as kind of a man of a personal taste, and um, that was was the, the best equipment. I had never problems with batteries. Um, it was more the, the other way around that that once um, it was too cold um, that mountain guides said well let's better not shoot it was minus 35 degrees Celsius plus wind chill and so quite wow. cold and but I had never problems with with, with the equipment so far also Nikon batteries are, are quite good um, at the moment I'm I'm looking, of course, at the, the new Sony camera, and um, probably will be trying to, to optimize that even further. At the moment, the additional weight I'm, I'm taking with me um, is about six to eight kilograms that I split up in between me and the mountain guide, and that's about doable. Um, if you now take, for example, a look at a, a classic classical tour, like the, the Matterhorn that I showed before, it looks like that. You have this um, triangular shape, and you see there the Matterhorn is, is um, 4,478 meters high, and there's, there's the Hernley Hut here at the bottom, the starting point. And uh, several sections there, and then there's the, the Swiss summit because uh, the Matterhorn is on the border in between Switzerland and Italy. So the summit ridge really is the border. 
And first, as soon as H965, more than five and five so far. The difference in altitude that you're doing here is 1,218 meters. Normally, you start around 4 a.m. in the morning, and you need in between four to five hours to go up there, and about the same time, or maybe three to four hours, to come um, down again. Um, in climbing books, it's nicely called a uh, free fall area along all the routes. So you would need to be careful with, with every step. And once you re reach the summit, you see this panorama here. And for example, you see here this nice ridge. <laughs> so imagine this. Maybe you close your eyes. You imagine you're standing on literally an ironing board, white uh, summit ridge, and the the drop to the left and to the right is about two and a half thousand meters. Jeez. Cool. Oh, is there, was it windy up there? Uh, no. no, no, no. Oh, at, at least at least you uh, at least you can um, decide because left is Switzerland and right is Italy. So. <laughs> 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 so and. Or um, to illustrate it better, I had somewhere uh, a shot here. And you're standing literally there where the arrow is. And all, all the, the sonore face, all the other parties are a threefold area. That's a shot also taken from, from up there while we were there. OK, um, I did then also, that was about four or five years ago, um, the time before the automated heads came up, I tried to find a way to um, to save time, to get faster. That's where I started to shoot with two cameras mounted back to back, uh, which allows you to shoot gigapixels in, in half of the time. One camera capturing the up, upper sphere, the other one the, the sphere down. That's, that was another technique that I used, which is not so needed anymore uh, since you have the, the automated heads. Then um, I can just show you uh, a few panoramas more. Um, that's one that I took at the bottom of the Madron mountain, right there when the, when the, where the climbers start. And the the lines, the lights you see there, are the that's the hut, are the the trails of the headlamps of the climbers. That, wow. that day it were eighty climbers. So it's really it's really a kind of a rush there uh, during the summer season. You have about um one to two months to climb the better one, uh, where the, the conditions are good. That one here is another one. Also in that area, you can again see here um, the Matterhorn Mountain. That's the area of, of Surmount, where I grew up. And sometimes you have to improvise and use the Summit crosses as extended tripod holder. <laughs> nice. That's also, that's also something you can do. Um, um, interesting also is this here, the I call it the anti-vertigo training panorama. That's the descent uh, of the Monk Mountain in the, in the Swiss Alps. And here you can see how much space you have to place your legs. It's about 800 meters on each side. Oh my god. Wow. And that's the mountain guide there. 
So um, it's it's really uh, especially there also sometimes because one my my cousin is mountain guide um, and he um, told me once that one of his guests guests slipped out on the summit of the Matterhorn, started to falling down one side. So the only option he had was to jump to the other. Ah, oh, because you were tied on with the rope to yes, balance them out. Yes, exactly. exactly. You were tied to the mountain guide with the rope, and in the end they found them uh, hanging one on each side. And so that's kind of kind of that. Um, that, um, or exa for example, I can also show you this one here, which is a night shot of Mont Blanc here, in full moon. And here you can see the famous Mer de Glace. And what you can see here on the on the horizon is the the, the colors that um, come uh, for the, the sunrise. And especially in the mountains, you can nicely see the see the shadow of the Earth just minutes before sunrise because you're so high up. So um, this last one here, um, panorama, I shot that um, for um, one of my exhibition projects, which was called Top of the Alps, that I did together with uh, Willy Burkhardt. Um, it was done in a, in a museum in Switzerland. Um, as uh, as Thomas uh, told us before, um, there's this website of Ulrich Deutschle, and I'm using his website as well to to pre-visualize the panorama. So, so um, I the, the the main idea here was just that we needed to find a location to shoot the panorama showing Mont Blanc, and with that website I could find this location, and the result was that. I was shooting a gigapixel panorama there, but not only to show it in a digital form on a touch screen or whatever, or online. Uh, we did a cylindrical print again. Um, it was a cylinder with four meters in diameter on some textile material, and then put it up again. So um, people could literally walk in and really found them themselves standing there, um, right on, on that summit. And we also had some some cameras, that's that Kodak Panorama camera that I mentioned before, which has a swipe lens that goes from left to right, or from right to left. Um, and for example, also we had this camera here, which is the first camera that Sites did. It was the, the founding of the company Sites Roundshot in the 1850s. And you also had touch screen or here the work of Lily Burkhardt, who, who I mentioned before, with small, with uh, huge big prints. So that was this exhibition project. So um, uh, another project where, where especially time was critical was um, the project I did for, for Mammut. Mammut is the Swiss outdoor brand. Um, they do all kind of outdoor equipment, can be compared with, with, uh, with North Face in, in the US. And they had their 150 um, years anniversary. And for that, they um, did in Switzerland, um, uh, an anniversary base camp, which consisted of of 150 tents set up there and doing all kind of tours during that year and so on and so on. And they wanted to capture um, uh, panorama also of that event um, because during that, during that, they also um, wanted to shoot. Um, a new key visual for their um, advertising campaign. Um, they have, they're very well known, 
for their um, their uh, key visuals, and they got several prizes for it and so on. For example, the left one was one for boots. All these shots are um, people in there are mountain guides, and all these shots are not photoshopped. They're uh, they're uh, real. Shot by a uh, famous Swiss photographer Robert Bush. He's a uh, famous uh, out of photographer. The right one, of course, was one for ropes. Then they had one for ski touring equipment, one for underwear, and so on, so on. And so what they wanted to do is to shoot such an image for their 150 uh, anniversary base camp with people um, that form the continents of the world. And my task there was to, to shoot kind of making of image of it, but in high quality, so a uh, <coughs> gigapixel. The main problem we had, um, here you see a cloudless sky. Just a few minutes later, it looked like this. So you see here, you have changing clouds all over the time. And here you can still spot my camera there. So the idea was to, to uh, place the camera in the middle of the, of the people there, shoot the 360 gigapixel panoramas. Panorama. And <clears throat> there you can see one spot uh, more. And the result was um, the result was this image here. I think it's about, yeah, it was 300 images or so. And that one was also done with the with the site's uh, rear drive. And since it's gigapixel, you can really zoom in there to the faces. And we did not do at that time back then uh, Facebook tagging plugin, which would have been nice. But yeah. So you see, for example, for this shot, time was really really critical and. Yeah, I, I think this shot wouldn't have been possible uh, without uh, uh, a robotic head. Yeah, the Zeitz re round shot too has a speed mode. Yes, it's probably it's probably got the best speed speed mode out of any um, automated head. Exactly. So you just by setting the the turning speed of it, you can uh, define your exposure time, and then you just have to adjust. Uh, you just uh, aperture and uh, ISO just to reach which the best result. Um, so that was one image. Another one I shot for them was this one here, uh, which was located on on a peak just above that camp with the 150 tents. And you can see here that's the location is the Jungfrau Jok in Switzerland. And also, these were the gigapixel, but not just showing uh, the Jungfrau mountain here, also the Mönch mountain, the Eiger mountain here, and you can even zoom in into the people. And then out, out again. So that was that was another one. Interesting also here, that was shot the, the day before the other one. And also here, the weather was really, really critical. This blue sky was probably the only um, blue sky we had during that day during 15 minutes. So we were really um, standing right there on the summit, wait, waiting for good conditions. Then just uh, shot it. When we were finished, um, I packed together my gear, um, put together the tripod. Um, with uh, turning my back to this area here, and then I turned back, and suddenly this whole area was covered with clouds. Wow. And then we were uh, getting back to the hut that you can see down there, and then back back over there to, to the Jungfrau Joch, and um, it started raining, hailing, and so time, uh, weather can really change that fast during the Alps, uh, in the Alps, I mean. So you have to keep up that in mind. And the special thing about this image, just to illustrate um, 
the quality of it is that it now um, covers a meeting room at the Mammoth Base. Oh, nice. Wow. The headquarter in Switzerland, which is a print um, on um, backlit uh, material. And it really gives you that, the, the feeling of, of being on the, the summit of the mountain. Um, also here, the, the print is, of course, uh, perspectively corrected so to the, the shape of the room so that you really still have the feeling um, of, of standing there on the mountain. That's so um, that's just a few examples. I hope I did not have did not have too long with my with my presentation. No, I just no. would that's like to close with the with a quote of Edward Wimper, the the, the English man who, who uh, first climbed the Matterhorn, which is do nothing in haste, look well at each step, and from the beginning think what may be the end which is, I think, quite suitable also for shooting uh, alpine panoramas. Wow. Thank you. Thanks, Matthias. I really appreciate your presentation. I think it gives a really great background on, on you know, alpine photography and, and the evolution into, you know, alpine panoramic photography. And it's, I'm sure you're going to be a key person in the history of, um, of this profession. So great, great stuff. Um, I think, I think Joe actually got his um, audio working. Can Joe, are you there? Hey Joe, can can we? I can't hear you. Now your audio is gone again. Okay, we're gonna go over to um, uh, Gerald. Yes. Are you I'm there? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Okay, it's, you're up. Let me see. Okay, so my name is Joe Blondie from Bushman Panoramic. Uh, I'll tell you a bit of my background. I uh, was born in Morocco. We lived there five years. Then we moved to South Africa. Then we stayed there seven years. Then uh, I'm French originally. <laughs> and then went to France for seven years. And uh, after that, went to US for four years. Then France, uh, back to France for five years. Then worked in Congo for one year back to France and now living in Czech Republic since five years and this is where we started the adventure of Bushman Panoramic five years ago and um, we started doing uh, panoramic heads it was in the beginning for uh, for uh, for fun for uh, trying out doing our own panoramas and then after a couple of years we had a couple of good ideas that we pushed forwards and we spent three years developing uh, a quantity uh, of qu about 12 different products and which are being released uh, as time goes by. So I think the connection with me, with uh, the rest of the team, is more on the equipment side than the photo shooting, because I'm not a specialist of the mount. And hot areas. And uh, all this gives us uh, ideas on how to make our products better, more useful and uh, more easy to use. So we focused our equipment mainly on um, lightweight equipment and making it as simple as possible. So you save time when uh, shooting your panoramas. And we try to integrate a, lit a little bit of design and trying to take a maximum of the mechanism part out to hide it as m most as possible, so it looks at least uh, a pleasant product and uh, hopefully pleasure to use. Um, so I'm more used to do answering technical questions than, than doing presentations. But uh, our first uh, first panel head was the uh, was the Kalahari head, which was released uh, two years ago. Uh, the f main idea on uh, our head was uh, doing a rotator um, for one lens, meaning when you go up in the mountain or you go in a, in a certain area, you usually take one, uh, I don't know if we can see it here, can you, you guys see the screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, okay. The, the, f the main idea was to have uh, 
uh, the small small equipment, lightweight, and uh, we had developed at first uh, a free rotation um, uh, quick lick that you can see on the bottom here. I don't know if you see the mouse or not. And uh, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out the best quality, at least developing the, the high high end quality uh, material and. Uh, uh, for example, the alloy used in the panel heads is uh, not commonly used in the industry, but um, in uh, car racing, they use it a lot as they need uh, lightweight and very resistant material. This is why we managed to have very sl uh, sl um, slim rails. So we developed the, the Kalahari head for a while, and uh, on the side we were continuing, and we realized that uh, this works very well for all big lenses, but uh, myself only doing, only enjoying small equipment and lightweight, uh, lightweight equipment, small lenses, I uh, pushed and uh, we started uh, doing the Gobi head, which, which came out fairly fast enough and uh, which is becoming a great success. And the advantages of uh, the Gobi head and the Kalahari head is all the, all the equipment is compatible with each other. For example, if you want to use one arm, one rail, vertical, optic, uh, optic rail or base uh, rail, you can all exchange them between the different heads. And uh, we have, uh, of course, we came up with a, a funny funny small idea that's been quite useful and which saves time is the rotation. I don't know if you see the rotation on the screen. Okay, so you got a, a, small, a small feature which we find very practical to shoot the nadir. Uh, the gobi head is a small head that fits in the pocket and you can very well do spherical panoramas as long as you're using small optical lenses and um, you can you uh, you can do uh, spherical panoramas as well as uh, normal standard portrait uh, landscape sorry panoramas just with the uh, base base plate I don't know if we can see it here these are simple photos from the website I don't know if you did see the rotation okay. And uh, so this is uh, our big uh, big advantage. This is what we're working on and spending a lot of our energy focusing on is, of course, uh, the lightweight lightweight part. And we started introducing our tripods and the do monopod at the same time with the carbon fiber solution, um, which basically is a big advantage when using, for example, the Gobi head and the Amarula tripod, the carbon fiber. The combination of both of them, you're at one kilo nine hundred, uh, one kilo two hundred ninety grams, which is uh, a lot, a lot of demand for that, and uh, people seem to be pretty satisfied. I don't know if anybody has any questions on the equipment itself. Um, I'm actually, um, yeah, I just want to show everyone. So this is a, um, this is a Gobi, the the uh, Bushman Panoramic Gobi, and uh, this is the uh, A7R on there, and um, I don't know the exact specifications, but it's, I mean, it's it's literally like I could hold it with my finger, um, and just tighten it, you know. Would 320 grams, just the Gobi head. Yeah, but I mean the A7R, so, and then the, the, my, my issue is I'm waiting for the I have a Metabones adapter, so I can put Canon lenses on there. But um, I'm waiting for um, for a Zeiss lens that's made for the A7R because I don't want to carry the extra weight, and I just want to have maybe something like 100 millimeters or or, or larger um, for some portable lightweight gigapixel images. So um, amazing! It's a perfect panel head, though, for for lightweight alpine um, uh, shooting. Um, do you have the image from um, from Iceland? Yes, I have. I'd, the, like to, <laughs> I'd like to show that one. Okay. Uh, so, is shaking his head. <laughs> that was the topic in the hotel 
lobby. It was yeah. the best. It was the best image oh. captured from the IVRPA oh. conference in Iceland this year, for sure. So this was this was a trip to the Ice Lagoon at the end of the uh, IVRPA trip. Um, uh, it was a combination of uh, sitting in the conference room and listening to the. Uh, the presentations and running out uh, uh, to get some images and uh, enjoying ourselves. So we went out. I don't know if you can see the screen right now. No, it's on. Let me change. Uh, it's still the pan. It's yeah. It yeah. was. It was still yeah. the. Uh... Let me change it. One second. There. Can you see? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. There you go. Okay. So we went on a, on a trip. We had rented a, a car with uh, uh, Nick Ivanov and uh, Andrew Budrov, and uh, so we had uh, we headed out for four hours driving there and four hours back, and um, so this was some of the photos that uh, Andrew and uh, Nick took. I was not aware in the beginning, but I thought they were pretty nice and uh, interesting. Uh, what I wanted to do when I went there is I uh, I don't like going to places and always taking photos that many other photographers will do a much better job than myself. And so I wanted to find something different and original. So uh, every time there's water, I always try and cross it to see if it's possible. So this is how uh, I managed to, to, to go out, not only in standing where every, all the photographers usually stay, but... Uh, crossing the water and getting myself a little wet. So this was all the part of the photographers, Andrew fighting with his pole, and uh, everyone taking photos, cars just going in and out. So this was on the little island. Uh, of course, I'm trying uh, the, the equipment. The Kobe head was just released, and uh, we're trying it in all different conditions. This was one of the panoramas. Um, am I going too fast, or is this all right? No, this is perfect. Side? Okay, so this was. Uh, let me go back. This is on the on the little island here. Uh, I thought I had a shot of the overview of the island. No. Okay. So this was the panorama taken uh, on the middle of this little island. There's water all around. Uh, trying some so the the equipment in the salt water, and uh, I was looking for. Uh, I was basically making photos uh, for the equipment and trying to get unusual shots. So, oh, there we go. So I did another panorama. This was on the rock where I'm standing right there. I put a, set up the tripod, and uh, the panorama is simply done on the rock. Of course, the water was a little cold. And um, I wanted to try and get and reach an iceberg. So I was, I was going around trying to figure out if I could reach, because it was getting pretty dark. And with the light, you, can't see, you couldn't see in the water. It was very dark. And uh, so it was hard to go forwards and uh, not know what was uh, ahead, if it was going down steep or <laughs> if it was okay. So I was trying to find a piece of ice where I could set up my uh, the small uh, small head to get uh, this uh, this shot that I wanted. Of course, this little piece of ice uh, did not fit, so I was running around trying to find another piece of ice, trying to move this one to see <laughs> if I could get, <laughs> get this shot that I wanted. And, I love uh, the fact so that somebody was like, they were taking pictures of you the whole time, waiting for you to fall. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> but anyway, so I was trying, and then I, at one point I managed to find this big piece of ice. But uh, not knowing, the the icebergs make make a lot of lot, lot of noise. Actually, there was a lot of crack and cracking, a lot of uh, movement, and I was I didn't feel too confident at the beginning. And then I managed to reach uh, the iceberg and took the equipment up there. But you see, yeah, there. So this is uh, me on the little piece of ice, and I was very worried because I'm. I'm look how look how you just I'm, put your camera down. You're so brave. <laughs> this you just I left your camera brave. right there on the <laughs> on the left. Um, so this is it was on the iceberg, and it was. It was it was moving, so I was a little worried. The first time I go on a piece of ice, I'm more used to a uh, desert or a uh, harsh area, or uh, like Africa than uh, on an iceberg. But anyway, so I went there. I, the hard part was to get on the iceberg, 
Of course, I went to the water, but it was so slippery, so freezing cold. And after a while, of course, uh, I think you can all relate. You don't feel your hands too much. And I don't know in this uh, this after half an hour fighting and running in the water, it was getting a little cold. Anyways, it was. Uh, oh, this is me trying to absolutely get on the piece of ice. It took me quite a while to, to figure out how to <laughs> go on because there was no step. I was It was extremely slippery, so every time I was pushing up, I had no idea if I was going to fall flat on my face or not. But anyways, I thought it would be worth the while, and I didn't want the same photos. I wanted something different. And uh, so this is it. Happy to be on the iceberg. And the problem is it started floating away a little. So... Yay! That's it. I don't know if the pictures are, are neat enough. Then I, I decided to go back and do a little Bushman panoramic advertisement with my uh, uniform Bushman panoramic on, of course. And that's the water coming out of the shoes, of course. The equipment, this was the photos from the, from the iceberg. This was uh, just off the little island of uh, stones. And this is the panorama shot on the iceberg. So it was a very strange because I had no idea if the iceberg was just going to snap or not. But uh, after a while, it started moving, so I couldn't stay there too long. This is Andrew Bodrov doing a pole dance. And this is the equipment that I was using, of course, mine. And uh, that's it. There were a couple other shots of the where I had to cross so you guys have the water a, uh, again. Do you have an interactive version somewhere? Yes. Let me pull it up. Oh, that's nice. Change screens. Can you see the the screen here? Yes, I saw your. Um, it's your uh, website. Yeah. Is it on? Yes. Okay. So this was on the iceberg. So once you once you're up there, you can see it in the wa in the water, but. Uh, uh, it's, it, it's pretty I just dark. See, I kind of just see a white screen. Does anyone else see it? Yes. Can I do a full screen? No. White. There you go. There it is. Yeah. Can you try a full screen? Oh. Is it working? Uh, it's it's when you go full screen that we lose it. Okay. So, so just stay there. So go back to the yeah. There you go. Okay. Just stay in that mode. I so I also was, have a version. Uh, Overlooking the whole ice lagoon, if you want to see. Yes, I, please. <laughs> I'm scared of that one. Let me try. So when I was there, I tried shooting a gigapixel of the of the ice lagoon. Here. And obviously, I learned my lesson that those those um yeah, let's switch over to Thomas here. So those ice that ice is moving so fast. Yeah. Uh, if you try to shoot a gigapixel image of it, I didn't have the round shot VR drive. I wish I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's pretty hard to capture that, and I was trying to shoot with a 300 millimeter, so I was being overly ambitious, I think. But yeah. Anyways, nice. if anybody goes back there, uh, I left my sunglasses. You can bring it back <laughs> if you find them. <laughs> <laughs> where's the where's the picture of you without your shirt on? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I literally can't hear you. <laughs> oh boy, that was the yes. best best image from the whole conference. That yeah, was a, it. Was the last day, so we did have fun. Yeah, I don't know if I'll you can see it. Gerald, amazing work as always, and uh, you know, um, between your panel heads and the Nodal Ninja panel heads, I'm you know. Mm -hmm. And um, they're just they're fantastic, fantastic equipment. Um, 
Cool. Well, we'll make sure we'll... Oh, well, I saw no shirt there. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to... Um, I don't know if Joe's... Is your audio working or not? Oh, there it is. Here's the island. Here's the iceberg. Nice. So I did want to say uh, I'm sorry for overheating the car on the way back because I was so freezing cold that for four hours I think we had the heat on. <laughs> <laughs> you were I don't know what they call them in, in Europe, but in, uh, they're, in the U.S. they're called waders. They're like what fishermen use, ice fishers. Yeah. You go ice fishing. And mm -hmm. um, I think if I ever go back to Iceland, I'll, I'll bring a pair of those. <laughs> yeah, next time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cool. Well, I'm going to I'm going to ask Joe. It doesn't seem like his audio is working. Um, I'm going to ask him to call my cell phone and then we'll pipe in his audio through um, through the phone. Um, also, um, we have um, another guest that's joined the show. I actually didn't originally think he was going to be able to make it. Um, his name's Jonathan Byers. Um, and he does um, amazing amazing work, not just in panoramic photography, but also just in, in standard professional photography. Um, with his website, which is called mountainrivers.com, and he's also joined us as well. So we'll have him be the last guest, and he'll 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 go on after Joe. Um, so if Joe, if you want to just give me a call on my cell phone, um, I will put you on speaker. We get we get creative uh, during this show. We had a guy. Um, one of our episodes was called Oceans, and he was broadcasting um, 60 miles on his sailboat off the coast of, um, I think it was New Caledonia. Um, and so we, he just piped in his audio, and then we, I ran the, um, the, uh, the show for him. So, let's see. Are you call me? Oh, there you go. Hey, Joe, you there? Joe. We got you on speaker? Yeah. Okay. You're all set. You're going to have to keep it up to your... You're going to have to keep this, the phone up to your mouth, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> So we were at. You were just showing us where the Columbia Ice Field was. The yeah, I'm gonna out. get back to that right here. Yep. You guys see it? Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm not sure where you guys lost the audio, but um, so I think we followed the Columbia a little bit up to the Columbia Ice Field and I showed you Columbia Lake, which is the headwaters of the Columbia River. Columbia Lake's down here, Ice Field's up here, and this is the focus of the Columbia Ice Field Gigapixel Project. And so that's the general idea of the area right here, and I will go back to, uh, this, and here. Okay, so from Wilcox Pass, which is right above the Icefield Parkway. This was the first shot I got this last season back in June. And it was it was a good day, uh, a little cloudy as you can tell, but shot this with the 400 on my 40D and the Gigapan and right over here just for resolution and scale. 
this is Mount Athabasca up here, and then down here, you can see two climbers kind of going up. Um, and this is a two gigapixel image. So this is the largest one of the project so far. And so let me come back out here a little bit. So to get to this location, I'll actually hop over to the newsletter I just kind of created. And come down to the section on that shot. So here's the setup on the Wilcox Pass with the Athabasca Glacier running up here, which is one of the exit glaciers of the Columbia Ice Field. And I got the pro mode up here, the 400, and then the gigapan on my tripod. And the route that I took to get here was come down. Here's you guys see this track on here on there? Yeah, it's a little bit small, but uh, okay. But yeah. Um, so that's the route I took from the Columbia Ice Field Center up to the location and then back down. Um, never found the trail that was described in the guidebook uh, that's supposed to cut through the trees kind of further to the left than where I went up. But it ended up being a fun little day out and the terrain was pretty much this kind of stuff up the cliff face. You know, I don't, Joe, I don't know if you got a chance to talk about sort of the premise behind the Columbia Icefield project. What's that? I was just saying, I don't, I don't remember, recall if you were able to sort of uh, tell the audience a little bit about what the Columbia Icefield project, Gigapixel project, was about. Oh, okay. Yeah, I kind of forgot where I left off. So, the main point of the Columbia Icefield project is to kind of raise a little awareness about the kind of uniqueness of the Columbia River and how it's connected to the ice fields up in Canada along with the um, along with the local glaciers on Mount Adams and uh, Mount Hood and um oh okay um and so, basically, I've connected with a few scientists. One is up in up in Canada, out of the University of Saskatchewan, uh, Dr. Mike Demuth, and um, um, he's kind of my main contact. He's doing all the mass balance studies on the ice field itself. And so these high resolution images that I get will actually be going to him to add to his to add to his um, data sets. And then along with that, hopefully at some point do a tour throughout the community that live in the Columbia Basin, which is basically this area that reaches all the way into Wyoming and the Tetons, I think a little bit in Montana, through Idaho, and parts of Oregon, and then this darker river section is the main Columbia River, and this was, I think I mentioned it earlier before my audio went out, but this was pretty much all inspired by the previous article I wrote where I kind of discovered what Glacier Works was doing and what um, what Eric talked about previously. Um, and then that was that first shot I ever took of Mount Hood. And um, yeah. So 
only get this because the weather cycle was really fast changing from rain to clear to cloudy to high winds. And so I didn't really get that um, kind of artistic kind of 360 image that I wanted. But from a scientific perspective, it's still pretty decent because it shows where the current glacier is at. This is the Saskatchewan Glacier from Parker Ridge. And the resolution is still pretty good. So it'll be a good addition to Mike's uh, work up there. Uh, and uh, okay, here we go. So these are all the planned locations for the Columbia Ice Field. Is that still kind of small, Gavin? Uh, it is. Are you able to zoom in at all, or what? That are you able to enlarge enlarge that a little bit somehow? Yeah. It's okay if you're not. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, I, I can't get it any larger than that. Um, but here, I'm using Google Earth. I found the locations. And pretty much so far, I've gotten Wilcox Pass, which is below Nigel Peak. And then I got Parker Ridge of the Saskatchewan Glacier down here off the, uh, just above the Big Bend. And I have quite a few other locations to get to, as you can see. And, um, I mean, Are you uh, going to be doing this shoot all by yourself? The entire, all the different locations? Um, these first two trips were all solo, um, just because I couldn't. It was difficult to find people to join me at that kind of late notice. Yeah. Well, I mean, if there's alpine um, panoramic photographers that are watching this up the show, uh, would you be interested in? Eliciting su support? Oh, yeah, I need to build my network. Because um, the network I have definitely didn't pan out um, for the weather windows that presented when I could go, you know? Because um, the first trip was. Okay, let me take this off. Um, the first trip was basically a one day kind of solo trip, and I flew up. To Calgary, drove to Columbia Asheville over the night and did the Wilcox Pass shot and then drove back and barely made my next flight out to come back. And that was basically June 16th. That was two days before Calgary, Banff, and Canmore had their big floods up there. And, um, so that was a unique trip, and then my second trip, I drove up. Um, that was another solo drive up. That was been about four days up there, and uh, kind of after, right after the Parker Ridge shot, it decided to pretty much snow up on the upper reaches, so I couldn't go for Saskatchewan like I was previously thinking of. And so I ended up coming back early just because the weather kind of got bad. Uh, and I'm not sure. Yeah, I think. Oh, a whole text of 
Yeah, wasn't that the worst flooding they'd ever they've seen in a hundred years? What's that? Wasn't that the worst flooding events that they've seen in a hundred years? Uh, yeah, it was definitely considered one of those hundred year events. Um, then Boulder experienced a similar event shortly thereafter out in Colorado. They had some massive rains that took out a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and I guess another thing that I just got reminded of to talk about here is that I'm trying to get images from the uh, White Museum of the Canadian Rockies and to do some match photography. So that's kind of what depicted that Park and Ridge shot along with the suggestion from Dr. Mike Demuth was to get up there because it has the best view of the Saskatchewan Glacier. And if the screen share is actually still working, I know it's kind of small, but you can see the gigapan and tripod right here. And then you can see the current extent of the glacier ice with a little lake in front of it and then here's the shot to the right that Byron Harmon took in uh, 1924. Glacier Tove is a lot further out, it's a lot thicker and so this, this is really kind of the first kind of match that I've done on this project but I hope to do more. I just need to talk to the White Museum a bit more about Give me a hand with acquiring the images and stuff like that. Thanks. Um, nice. See if I can actually get. Joe, we're, lo we're losing your, your audio on the phone here. Can you just speak into the phone a little bit better? Definitely 
way quite different. Um, and then just feeling that I hear the one Have you, had any, have you had any problems with the bat? Have you had any problems with the battery on the Gigapan in the cold environment? Well, um, we'll make sure we, yeah, we'll make sure we link to uh, to your project. Um, I, I know in the past you've been looking for different um, climbers and um, alpine photographers to join you in your in your mission to bring awareness to the Columbia Icefield project. So if you're still interested in that, um, we can we can add links to the show notes. And uh, and I appreciate. Thank you so much for um, for sharing your work. Um, you know, I know it's it's Sorry definitely. Being all broken and choppy. Oh no, worries, no worries. Um, it it happens all the time, so we're you know we're used to it. Um, with different you know guests, it just you know this Google Hangouts is still a new interface, and um, depending on where people are, um, you know, it can be it can be tricky. So we've got actually one last one last guest here. Um, I don't know. Do you know um, do you know Jonathan Byers, Joe? Yeah, yeah, he's um let's see, Jonathan, you there? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we're losing you your audio is going on that cell phone as well, Joe. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna switch over to Jonathan. Thanks so much. I appreciate you taking the time to show us your work. Um okay. Jonathan, we're uh we're, we've got you here. Great. Can you um, hear me? We can. Yeah. There's no video oh, okay. for you. Um, oh, video's turned on for me. Yeah, I don't know. We've so, been having problems with with a lot of guests this today with with video feeds. I don't yeah. know if it's just because there's a holiday break and every. Uh, but see if you can do a, see if you can test out your screen share. Yeah, let's try that. And we, uh, your audio is fine. Uh, you're uh, so Jonathan uh, Byers. He, um, where do you reside usually? And you're right now you're broadcasting out of Joshua Tree. Is that that's correct? That is correct. Yeah, in Joshua Tree right now, but normally based out of either Yosemite National Park or Boulder, Colorado, or uh, Southern Patagonia. Nice. So kind of bounce around quite a bit. 
Um, but so yeah, um, I, can you all see my screen share here? Uh, not yet. Not yet. All right, nope, let's nope. try. Can you see it, uh, Thomas? No. Okay. All right. Let's let's see here if this is gonna work. Only the voice I can. Um, it might just. Oh, there you go. I see oh, it. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. So I guess uh, this has been a really fascinating conversation because the work I've been doing is a project called Alpine of the Americas Project. We started this about two years ago um, in the Sierra Nevada of California. As uh, just a trip, we were going out backpacking through the highest parts of the Sierra Nevada and wanted to find these historic photos, such as this G.K. Gilbert photo on the left here, uh, and find their exact locations and repeat them. And this had been done in quite a few other places, but as far as we knew, no one was really doing this kind of work in the Sierra Nevada. Um, so two summers ago, we did a trip through the Sierra Nevada, repeating, finding these locations, as precisely as we could, and then repeating them. And uh, we found not only large changes in the glaciers and snowfields in the Sierra Nevada, but also large changes in the forests and the ecosystems. As you can see here, we have the same rock in this 1904 photo by G.K. Gilbert, and then in 2011 as well, but the forest structure has changed dramatically. So we took these ideas and uh, then started contacting scientists who we knew were doing this kind of work, talking to them, seeing whether they could use these images for their work, and uh, ended up finding a lot of scientists who thought this was really useful, and so the project sort of started from there. And the idea behind it is that um, while we do some panoramas, uh, the, the primary part of the project is to get other people out repeating these historic photographs. People who are out climbing, people who are out backpacking, repeating these photos and sort of seeing for themselves how the climate is changing. So as you can see, in 2011 we had a really high snow year. Uh, so in previous years where the glaciers were easy to see, we had significant amounts of snow left on the ground. So we've repeated many of these photos in the last two years when there's been a lot less snow and it's been very interesting to see. Um, hey, Jonathan, I still see the Mount Gardner's image. Oh, okay, let's see if I have can... You, uh, have you switched uh, yeah, over? Yeah, I've switched over. Maybe I need to re-screen share every time. We'll see if... <laughs> um, it's probably the bandwidth in Joshua Tree. It's, there it's, it's, we it's, go. It's, it's a small town. Yeah. Um, so... If you want to ping me, too, uh, do you, are, these on, are these online somewhere? These are actually all online, um, and can you just see. ping me? Why don't you just ping me the um, the URLs in the chat window? Yeah, that sounds great. Right um, and, and then so I will all, bring them up on my side. Okay, yeah, and all these photos for everyone else. These photos can be found on our website. Um, it's called alpineoftheamericas.com, um, and so this website we started. Um, Okay. You can see on the website, it's uh, then. So the next trip we did was we went actually down to Patagonia, to South America, because a lot of the climate scientists are telling us that this area is in in Patagonia, in Chile, is one of the most rapidly changing glaciated areas on the planet. Uh, the glaciers in Patagonia are changing at very very rapid rates, and as with some other places. Uh, the glaciers that are changing down there are affect people's water supplies, affect proposed hydroelectric dams. So it has real impacts on people's livelihoods. And so I'll show you all a few photos from down yeah. in Patagonia. If you just want to just, just now, yeah, just uh, yeah, just give me the URLs, ping me the URLs on the chat window, or if you want to just verbally guide me through your website. Okay. Yeah, just, so the website... I'm on the Patagonia page. Let's see it. Okay, can you... Well, let's see. Can you see if I'm... Or is the screen sharing still not... Yeah, it wasn't working on your end. I had to... I'm on my... Um, I'm screen sharing it from my, my window now. Okay. Can you all see so this? 
I'm on. Oh, yeah. So if you all can see on my my screen now, I'm in uh, I'm in Adobe Bridge, looking at some photos here. Can you see that? No, I just see your icon. Okay. Um, I think it's your. I think it's wherever you are. Yeah, the bandwidth connection. Is so... I'll just. Website images. Um, so we went down to Patagonia, and uh, the the changes down there are really, really spectacularly large. Um, and it's, it's interesting to hear what Matthias was talking about and Joe as well, because one of the most interesting things about this project and the experience of repeating these historic photographs is, is standing in the exact place where some of these photographers stood 80, 100, 150 years before, um, and seeing exactly, so you're on the trip report page, the, the Alpine America's repeat photos from South America show some really big changes, and um, some of these are panorama photos. Uh, we definitely are experimenting with techniques with using uh, gigapans in Yosemite. I've been repeating some this summer with the uh, some gigapan images or gigapixel images, um, but really the the primary use of these is is for climate scientists as illustrations and mostly just for people to see the changes that are going on, um, because in Patagonia especially there's a number of places where companies are planning on building dams downstream or they're planning major hydroelectric projects, where upstream the glaciers that feed them water are disappearing at a rapid, rapid rate, and they're not being taken into account. So it's it's a combination of science, photography, and I guess public participation, public education project that we do at Alpine of the Americas. Um, and so yeah, feel free to look through those photos on the site, and, and a big part of it too is streamlining the process of how to make it easy for people to go find these locations and repeat the photos for themselves. So uh, we've talked to Joe some about that, but there are a number of other photographers, at least uh, 15 or 20 at this point, who have participated in the project, gone out, repeated photos that maybe we've repeated before, but there are, I mean, I'm, as sh I'm sure you all know who have dealt with historic images, there are tens, hundreds of thousands of historic images that are out there that no one's visited, no one even knows really where they are, and the process of lining those up, finding those, and finding exactly where they are is actually a really fun uh, and fascinating project. Um, so, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm, I think it's neat to learn from you all about uh, the different techniques of panoramas and gigapixel photos because some of these original images, especially the ones like the one that... Uh, Gavin's sharing on his screen right now. Of that's down in Torres del Paine National Park, Glacier Gray, and you can see the the ice is in the historic photo way, way further out, probably six or eight kilometers further down valley than it is today. And to be able to see those changes, share those changes with people is a, it's a pretty spectacular thing. And many of the early photographers, as Matthias was talking about as well, were using large format plate images that when you scan, you can get incredibly high resolution out of. So trying to match that high resolution um, in the field with small cameras is a bit tricky, but uh, can work out pretty well and lets you see the, the changes in more detail. Um, Amazing stuff, amazing stuff. So, and you find yourself, and so you're down at, at these locations, you, you split it up basically weather permitting, you know, three times a year. You're in Colorado, South America, and where else? Sierra Nevada? Yeah, in the Sierra Nevada. So I've been, it's, uh, it sort of depends on, yeah, what I'm doing. I've been working for the National Park Service in Yosemite doing air and water quality studies for the past couple of years, seasonally in the summers and then going down to Patagonia to go climb and work as a guide some. But it's a bit of a tricky thing because when the weather is really nice to go climbing, 
I want to be out climbing on the peaks, and when the weather's really nice, that's the time you need to be out getting the repeat photos, because <laughs> the, especially down there, there's one guy, Alberto de Agostini, that we're actually working on publishing a book of all of his, of as many of his repeats as we can, because he's a fascinating character. He was an Italian priest and mountaineer who moved to Patagonia and uh, was putting up first ascents of major mountains into his 60s. And we're working with the uh, Museo Salesiano, the Italian, the Salesian priests who hold his photos um, on a on a repeat photo book of Patagonia. So prioritizing going down there and taking photos and and uh, seeing what this guy Alberto mm -hmm. Augustini saw is uh, is a really valuable tool. And hopefully, when this book is done, we'll be able to have a lot a lot wider audience down down in Chile because it should be a Spanish and English book. Um, because people down there, he's sort of a, the Ansel Adams, I guess you could say, of Chile, of Argentina. So people down there really know who this guy is. And uh, bringing some of these changes that we see in his photos to the general public through a photo book is one of our current projects. Um, but yeah, it's repeating photos is is fun, challenging, tricky, especially because what we really try and do is get it as perfect as we can. Try and match similar time of day, similar time of year, um, because one of the biggest criticisms is always, oh, that's taken in the spring, and the one you took is in the fall. That's just difference in snow melt. But when we're really looking at major changes in the actual ice that is there, um, right. Do you have any work on your website I should show, uh, Mountains and Rivers? Um, not particularly. That's just that's still definitely under construction <laughs> location. <laughs> um, the Alpine of the Americas project has sort of been the focus for a while. Um, but yeah, I mean, for people listening, people uh, interested, the other idea behind this is that it's going to be... Um, we're working on a back-end sort of historic photo repeat database. So, because as it currently stands, you know, I know Joe's been working on it. There's a bunch of people at Portland State. There's a lot of people around who are working on repeat photography projects. And we really think that the idea of crowdsourcing, of bringing other people who have training, who are photographers, who are interested um, into it, can definitely broaden the reach of the scientists, the people who are working on these projects. So hopefully we'll continue building collaborations and uh, getting more photos out there, because currently we have North America, the Sierra Nevada, and then the Andes in Patagonia, but um, repeating photos, we've started repeating photos in the Rockies, we've started repeating photos in uh, Peru and Bolivia, and so there's you know photos all over the world that are valuable evidence of climate change that are convincing to people and are useful education tools as well as scientific research tools. Amazing. Yeah, well hopefully this show will help um, spread that, you know, that message and also, you know, connect more people together so we can get this. I mean, you're absolutely right. It does seem like there there are groups of people doing this, but there's also a lot of people out there doing it on their own. There's some people doing it for corporations. Um, you know, so it would be interesting to, I think crowdsourcing is definitely the way to go. Um, yeah. Amazing, amazing stuff. And then, you know, you've also got, um, you know, Thomas is here with his, you know, mountain panoramas. I don't know if um, that's something that I, you know, would be interesting to see on um, on Thomas's site. You yeah, know, that's it, what, mm -hmm. it would be definitely interesting. interesting. Yeah. You know, if you could have like an overlay. Uh, you, if you could include like historic photos into your site, and then yeah. turn on overlays where you could see um, how how things have changed. Yeah, I, I already planned that. Uh, I have some, let's say, uh, very very old photographs from the Alpine Museum in Munich, and where you can see the changes. But it is uh, the first try was not very successful because you really have to distort the photos. Because one of the photos is always uh, has a different distortion, and this will be really a separate project with a lot of work. I have yeah. experienced. Yeah, we've been playing around with that too, and it is tricky because a lot of these early photos were, of course, you know, four by five or eight by ten 
plate cameras, oftentimes with, I found they actually, most of these old photos were with 35 millimeter lenses, but then of course I'm shooting on a, you know, Nikon DSLR with a zoom lens and it, it definitely does require some manipulation to get them to line up uh, exactly. But yeah, overlays are, are, would be a really useful tool. We haven't quite figured out how to make a online platform that supports overlays in a really useful, easy to use manner either. But again, potential collaboration. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for taking the time to show us all this work, and um, you know, keep please keep us posted. We're gonna, you know, we've just we've basically this is just episode six of the six of the panographers, um, but we're gonna do follow up episodes on every one and, and revisit uh, these topics. So, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time to show us the work that you're doing. And um, great, yeah, and thank you for making it happen. I know it sounds like you're in a cafe somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, in, uh, indeed. Joshua Tree. Yeah, uh, I'm amazed you were able to get internet to work out there at all. I, honestly. Yeah, uh, it seems to work all right. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, this has been fascinating, and look forward to hearing more, seeing more, and uh, you know, we'll stay in touch with the other folks that were part of this. Yes, thank you. I really appreciate you joining so last minute, and uh, Thomas and Joe and and everyone else that that joins uh, today. Uh, thank you so much for for taking the time out of your day to show us the work that you that you've done and the work that you're working on and all the and actually it's been a very educational episode for me as well um, I don't get out a lot um, when I do uh, you know these type of panoramas I'm usually um, at the base of the mountain shooting up so it's nice to see some people that are brave enough to go uh, ascend these these uh, summits and, and shoot vistas that um, most people can only dream about so Amazing stuff, and I just want to thank you for again for for hopping on the show. And thanks um, to you for the opportunity. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And uh, so it will be archived. The show will be archived on our website. Uh, uh, it's called the Panogs.com. P-A-N-O-G-S.com. Um, you can also find it on YouTube if you just search uh, the Panographers, and it, all the different episodes will come up. Um, but the uh, website for this show, Panogs, uh, it will also include show notes which are very useful for um, fellow um, panoramic photographers and photographers alone alike. And with that, I want to just say thank you so much and have happy holidays and have a wonderful Sunday. <laughs> Thanks to you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. You as well. Bye-bye. Right, have a good one. <laughs>